All right, good morning, everyone. Madam Clerk's going to go ahead and call the case to order. Case number 2020 CF 2603, State of Florida, Sarah Bunn. Department of Updates for the Record, we have the State. David Ketchfer, I'm happy to say. William Jay, for the State. Okay. Jay, for the State. Tony Henderson, for Sarah Bunn. Yeah, we're back. We have to go. Ms. Bowman, right here, hand, please, sworn, please, please swear, affirm the testimony she gave, shall be the truth, the whole truth, and then the answer will be done. I do. Good morning. Can you state your full name and date of birth for the record for me? Sarah Boone, 101077. Ms. Boone is seated at council's table wearing a dark gray suit jacket and a maroon blouse. She is in custody. However, she's not any restraint, in, in any restraints. So we will be continuing to stand as our jury enters and exits. State, are there any housekeeping matters we need to address this morning before we bring in our panel? Defense. Judge, I don't know if you got an email last night of potential witnesses for their call. In addition to the one I received this morning, yes, sir. In addition, we may call the uh, recall of the uh, phone extraction expert. That's she's not on the list. Okay, understood. All right, uh, are we ready to bring in our panel? Okay. All right. Very good. Let's go ahead and stand and bring in our panel. All right, to resume. State, do you recognize our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Defense, do you recognize our jury? Yes. All right, everyone can be seated. <laughs> Members of the jury, good morning. Welcome back to 12 Alpha of the Orange County Courthouse. I hope you had a great evening. Um, if you could, again, just by a show of hands, you complied with the court's instructions for the overnight break. Uh, record reflect all hands have been raised. Members of the jury, at this point in time, the defense is going to continue with their evidence and testimony presentation. And I'm going to ask them to call their first witness at this time. Mr. Owens, you may proceed, sir. At this time, the defense calls Deputy Grim Mayor Delgado. Thank <laughs> you. 
We swear all the time that we should give shouting the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So don't do that. Good morning. You can be seated, and can you please state and spell your name for the record for me? Yes, sir. My name is Jessica, first name Jessica, J-E-S-S-I-C-A. First last name is Ramirez, R-A-M-I-R-E-Z. Second last name is Delgado, D-E-L-G-A-D-O. Thank you, ma'am. You may inquire, sir. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Ma'am, how are you employed? I am a reserve deputy with the Orange County Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been employed with the sheriff? Seven years. Uh, back on July the 25th of 2018, how were you employed at that time? I was a full-time reserve, uh, full-time deputy sheriff of the agency. On that date, ma'am, did you have the occasion uh, due to your duties to report or to go to 4748 Franks Lane, apartment number three? Yes, sir. Uh, do you recall what you were going there for? Yes, sir. I was a backup deputy for a call involving a male kicking a female in the face. So it was, it came out as a domestic call. Okay. And was it another officer who also responded? Yes, sir. He was the primary. Okay. Ma'am, while you were there, did you have contact with Sarah Boone? Yes, sir. While having contact with Ms. Boone, were you able to observe any injuries? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. She had swelling and bruising in her right eye. And ma'am, were you able to make contact of Mr. George Torres. Yes, sir. Were you able to notice any injuries on his person? Yes, sir. He had red markings and some abrasions around his neck. Ma'am, at a certain point in time, uh, did you place Ms. Bloom under arrest? Yes, sir. I detained her and placed her in my vehicle. Ma'am, at that time, do you recall or remember Ms. Boom asking you, why am I in trouble? Yes, sir. And without saying what you said, but did you did you respond to her? Yes, sir. After that, ma'am, do you remember Miss Boone asking you why? Because I fucking fought back. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> no further questions. Thank you. Any cross examination? During the course of your investigation, you or the other responding deputies spoke to Mr. Torres as well? Yes, sir. After concluding all of your investigation, which involved talking to both Mr. Torres and to Ms. Boone and making your observations of the two of them, um, did you all make final decisions about how to handle your investigation. The other deputy, which at the time was Deputy Zito, was the one that made that determination. Okay. But that's collectively what you all looked at was statements from Ms. Boone and Mr. Torres, correct? Yes, sir. And your physical observations of both persons. Yes. yes. And then whatever else you may have observed on scene. Yes, sir. And you take into account uh, people's demeanor when they are giving you statements when assessing uh, their credibility. Yes, sir. Another question. Any redirect examination? No, Your Honor. Can this witness be released? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you. Defense, call your next witness. At this time, the defense calls Deputy John Alden. Good morning. Can you state and spell your name for the record? John Alden, 
J-O-H-N-A-L-D-E-N. All right, thank you, sir. You may be seated. Mr. Anderson, you may inquire. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, sir, how are you employed? How are you employed? I'm employed with the Orange County Sheriff's Office as a corporal. Back on August the 28th of 2019, how were you employed? I was a deputy in the Uniform Patrol Division in Sector 2. As a part of your job duties that day, did you have the occasion to respond to 4748 France Lane, number three? Yes. Uh, what was the purpose? Uh, there ended up being a battery call. And, sir, were you the lead officer on this case? Yes. Were there any other backup officers there with you? I believe so. Uh, sir, on that date, August the 28th of 2019, did you come in contact with Sarah Boone? Yes. Uh, sir, on that date, did you observe any injuries on Sarah Boone? Uh, I observed redness on the left side of her neck and what to be an old injury to her right eye. Sir, on August 28th of 2019, did you come in contact with George Torres? Yes. And uh, did you notice any injuries on Mr. Torres? Yes, he had some redness on it by his left eye. <clears throat> Sir, on that day, was Mr. Torres placed under arrest? Yes. Thank you. I have no further questions. Any cross-examination? Yes. Is it fair to say that Mr. Torres had quite a few marks on him? Uh, from my report, I remember marking the left by redness by his left eye. And did you have a body worn camera activated when you responded to this call? Uh, I believe so. And so that would be the best evidence of both video and audio as to what occurred while you were on scene. It would, especially since this happened four years or five years ago now. And uh, did Mr. Torres refuse to say what happened that day? He did. Based on the conclusion of your investigation, uh, which involved talking to Ms. Boone and attempting to talk to Mr. Torres, as well as your visual observations of both them and the scene, is that how you all reach your conclusions? Yes. Other questions? Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Can this witness be released? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Jack? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Defense, you can call your next witness. Yes. Defense, you can call your next witness. <clears throat> Judge, at this time, the defense calls uh, Deputy Costler. Or detective, excuse me.
的，我们把这个叫什么？小米的全部都是的，那个绿色的。Good morning again. Could you state your full name and date of birth for the record? I'm sorry, full name and spell it for us. It's Chelsea Kepsel, C H E L S E Y. Last name is K O E P S E L L. Thank you. Counselor, you may inquire. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. In relation to this case on <clears throat> February the 26th, of 2020, did you have the occasion to interview Abraham Marino? Yes, I did. Was that interview recorded, ma'am? Yes, it was. Do you remember as part of that interview that Mr. Marino <laughs> um, tell you that he had had contact with Sarah Boone on February the 24th? of 2020. Are you asking the night of the incident when police were called out? Yes, the next morning. The, the day that we were called? So that you were called out. Okay. So yes, he did have contact with her, um, but it wasn't in the morning. It was while we were there. Okay. Yes. What time did you get there? Um, I got there around uh, 14, 20 hours, which would be 2.20 in the afternoon. Okay. So the afternoon on the 24th? No, it was later. Um, I recall, um, I believe I was doing paperwork in my vehicle. So it would have been at some point during the investigation, but it wasn't, I didn't notice him until... <laughs> I'm not sure if I noticed him until before or after Sarah was interviewed. All right. But to his interview part, the interview, did he tell you in the interview that he had had contact with Miss Boone on that day? Yes, he did. Did he tell you at that time that Miss Boone had made a statement to him? Yes, yes, he did. Do you read? Remember what that statement was. I don't wish to quote what he stated. Um, so I don't know the exact verbiage, um, but he basically replayed what. Um, I'm not sure if he replayed what exactly occurred that day, um, but I do know he mentioned something about she mentioned being dragged down the stairs a couple of days prior. Um. Did he say to you during that interview that Sarah Boone told us that a couple of days ago they had gotten into a fight where he grabbed her by her hair and drug her down the steps? I would assume that he's reading my report and that does sound similar to what my report should say. So this statement was given on the 27th of February. I'm sorry, the 26th of February. Would yes. you agree with that? Yes, I would. Okay. The contact and the statement that Ms. Boone made uh, to Mr. Moreno was on the 24th of February. Is that correct? Repeat the question, I'm sorry. When Mr. Moreno was saying that Ms. Boone came up to him and made this statement that we just talked about? Yes. That was on February the 24th. Is that correct? That is correct. So when she said a couple of days ago, that would have brought it back to February the 22nd. Is that correct? Potentially, yes. Ma'am, during that interview with you, did Mr. Marino ever indicate to you that when he had contact with Ms. Boone on the 24th, that Sarah Boone told him what happened was an accident? 
Did, and did he say that Sarah Boone stated that she was teaching him a lesson and things got out of hand and that she fell asleep? I don't recall the entirety of that being accurate. Um, yeah, I don't recall the entirety of what he just said being accurate. Do you remember him saying that at all? He did say that she had, um, I believe he said on the recording, passed out. So that's why like part of the statements might be accurate, but. Ma'am, would it refresh your memory if you were to see the recorded statement? His recorded statement, yes. the transcription? Yes. Sure, yeah, great. May I approach the witness? You may. Now take your time. Okay. When you are ready, just let me. Okay. I don't recall all the statements that you asked or the way you asked it, but. Would it help if I repeat it? Sure, yeah. Okay. You asked, like, you said multiple statements. So yes, this was a, like 11 minute interview. All right. Uh, the statement would be that. Sarah Boone stated to Mr. Marino mm -hmm. that she was teaching him a lesson and things got out of hand and that she fell asleep. And I'm wanting to know. Did you say, okay, I thought I heard you say passed out the first time. I'm not sure if you said passed out or fell asleep. Fell asleep. Fell asleep. Okay. And what I'm asking is, is there any indication that he told you that statement on the date of that interview on the 26th. Sorry, I'm trying to go to the part where we talked about that. Yes, ma'am. Take your time. Okay. Okay, so um, like I had stated, there were certain things that I thought was accurate from your statement. Um, he stated, I don't really, do I just read exactly what it says? Do you need like the number next to it or anything? Yes, I have no problem with you reading what it says. Okay, then she- Approach. Ma'am, you cannot read the statement at this time. Okay. Thank you. You may continue, Mr. Henderson. He described... Um, okay. Hang on, hang on. No. Just wait for a oh, question. So okay. sorry. It's okay. Yes, sorry. <clears throat> Ma'am, did anywhere in that interview, do you see reference to this statement that Sarah stated that she was teaching him a lesson and things got out of hand and that she fell asleep. No to the two parts, the first two parts of your question. Um, I heard passed out the first time you asked me this question and that's why I said that part of it was accurate because it, he did say that she passed out in his statement. That was what Sarah told him. Okay, did she say she was teaching a, him a lesson? Is that in there? No. And things got out of hand. Is that in there? No, I don't recall that. May I approach the witness? Yes. And again, ma'am, this interview was on February the 26th of 2020. Is that correct? Yes, it was. Thank you. I have no further questions. Any cross-examination? No other questions, John. All right. Thank you. Can this witness be released? 
Yes, Your Honor. State? Yes, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Defense, call the next witness. <clears throat> I believe Dr. Brandon is here. All right. Making sure. Yes, sir. Members of the jury, we're just waiting on a witness. They uh, um, are using the facilities outside. So as soon as uh, they're done, we'll, uh, we'll bring in our next witness. Thank you for your patience. Your Honor, this time the defense would call Dr. Michael Brandon. All right, very good. you state and spell your name for the record for us? Uh, Michael Brannon, B-R-A-N-N-O-N. Thank you. Counselor, you may inquire. Dr. Brannon, good morning. Good morning. Ms. Fry, having just traveled from Miami to Orlando. Yes. Not the record? Okay. It was a good drive. Would you please describe for the jury your background, training, and experience, uh, both in forensic psychology as well as battered women's syndrome? Uh, sure. So um, I'm a psychologist uh, licensed in the state of Florida. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in psychology. That's from a university called Nova University. I also have a, a master's degree in psychology. Um, I received that in 1980, um, also in psychology. Um, and I received my doctoral degree in psychology after a year internship um, where I worked with severely mentally ill individuals in Hialeah, Florida. In 1988, I finished my degree requirements for my doctorate in psychology. 
Um, and in 1990, I was licensed um, as a psychologist. I've been operating as a, as a psychologist since then, since 1990. Um, originally, I started off doing the work that most people kind of think about when they think about psychologists, doing therapy, counseling with people, helping them through with their problems, things like that. In 1994, um, I began on a career um, almost quite accidentally um, as a forensic psychologist. And I testified in my first case in front of a jury. Um, and from that time on, I've been doing mostly forensic psychology. My practice very quickly changed from that time on. I'm currently the co-director of the Institute for Behavioral Sciences and the Law. And anywhere between 80 and 90 percent of all my work now is related to some legal or court related matter in the ways in which mental health interfaces or impacts or helps to give opinions about various legal issues. Um, I've uh, taught um, rather extensively in the area of forensic psychology. Um, I teach to mostly legal audiences, um, but oftentimes, too, I speak to groups of uh, uh, psychology students wanting to sit up here and do what I'm doing as well. I make long drives and then come up here and talk to, to people about cases. Um, I also um, currently um, on the uh, staff, um, the adjunct faculty staff for the School of Psychiatry um, at Florida Atlantic University. Um, I help to train their forensic psychiatrists, so not just psychologists, but psychiatrists in terms of doing this work as a psychologist or as a psychiatrist, a mental health professional who gives opinions in the courtroom. And are you also required to update your educational background and knowledge? Uh, as a forensic psychologist? Yes, sir. So sure. So um, every um, every two years, we're required to get 40 continuing education credits to maintain our license. And part of that is we have to, on a regular basis, update our work in domestic violence or battered women's syndrome. So we have to take those courses. We're all required, whether you're a forensic psychologist or not, to take that coursework. So as part of our requirements, we also have to take separate coursework in regards to Domestic violence is a general term or intimate partner violence, but along with that comes discussion as well with battered spouse or what's oftentimes called battered persons in from now. And I apologize. I'm kind of bouncing around here, doctor. I apologize again. For the uninitiated, just exactly what do you mean by forensic psychology? So forensic psychology is a, a division of psychology. Most people don't think about that as often when they think about psychologists. But forensic psychologists are individuals who have degrees in psychology who are working to help to answer questions that come up in the legal system. It could be in criminal cases like we're here for today, answering various criminal questions, giving opinions about those questions. Um, or it could be in other settings like family settings, uh, divorce proceedings, or sometimes civil settings like personal injuries. Someone's claiming some emotional damage or something has happened to them. So forensic psychology is really the way that we use the science of psychology to help give opinions about various legal matters. Now, what is the DSM or the DSM-5? Mm -hmm. The DSM is the, it stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Um, it's kind of our code book, if you will, to help us to know what the different symptoms are for different mental health disorders, whether it's major depression or schizophrenia or anxiety. So it gives us a code book of here's the criteria you have to meet in order to have that diagnosis. And then we're able to utilize that in terms of either treatment, so even insurance billing, um, but being able to inform patients, too, about what condition we think that they're suffering from. It's been updated many times over the years. It started just DSM, um, and now it's at the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5th Edition Text Revised. So we've gone through a lot of revisions over the years to try to fine tune an empirical or scientific way what the elements are, if you will, of various mental health conditions. Now, you've been asked to testify today in regards to the battered women's syndrome. Is the battered women's syndrome identified or located within the DSM-5? So it is not. Um, it is not a diagnostic category in the DSM-5 or other coding books as well. There's others besides the dsm that's just the most popular one, but it's not a formal diagnosis that it is contained within that book, a classification manual that I just told you about. Within your field of forensic mm -hmm. psychology, however, is there a subcategory that is located within the DSM-5 that experts would recognize as a DSM diagnosis? Yes, sir. And what is that? So that category would be in the trauma section of the DSM-5 TR. There's a whole category on trauma disorders. 
And it's most closely um, related to something that we call post-traumatic stress disorder. It isn't the only trauma disorder, but that's the one that bad, what used to call battered women syndrome. Now I refer to it as battered person syndrome, but all of it really is more connected to a trauma disorder like post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, testify that you testify on criminal matters. Do you also testify, you indicated also on personal injury cases and emotional, oh, that would be civil, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, in your experience, uh, you've testified as an expert, as a forensic psychologist, uh, you testified for, and today you're testifying for the defense or were called by the defense. Uh, do you also testify for the state of Florida or other states within the country? Uh, yes, to both of those. I've testified in other states. But I also testify for both prosecution, uh, the state or government, depending if it's federal or if it's a state case, and also for the defense. So I really get appointments and hired by both sides. But how many times have you been? Have you testified? Well, um, at, um, at last count, it was about 1,500 times. It's over that, way over that now. That was from a few years ago. I testify in, in a lot of different kinds of hearings and trials over the course of mostly in Florida, but in other states as well. Now, you're familiar with the fact that there is a special jury instruction that's been recognized by the Florida Supreme Court. Objection. Approach. The objection is sustained. I apologize. Uh, doctor, you testified as to battered women syndrome, battered person syndrome. Uh, are there other synonyms, synonyms or similar names for what you're describing, in particular battered spouse syndrome? Well, we talk about it in terms of trauma disorders like post-traumatic stress disorder, but the way when it's applied to the legal system, it's called battered wife, or that was the original uh, terminology for it, battered wife syndrome or battered person syndrome. So really depends on your setting. So in this setting, we oftentimes talk about this particular condition that I've been, Bless you. Asked, I've been asked to talk about today um, is uh, really referred to as battered spouse syndrome. And have you been asked to give your opinion as a legal expert uh, and on battered spouse syndrome? Yes, sir. How frequently have you been asked to do that? Um, I've been involved in about 100 cases um, of just that alone. I've been involved in some sort of testimony about 50 times. Uh, and you indicated, you indicated that you testified for the state, you testified for the defense, you testified in state cases, federal cases. Could you break down on a percentage basis uh, the number of times you testified for the state versus testifying for the defense? It's really close um, in terms of uh, the last time we looked at it, it was about 50 50. Um, on most cases, like for instance, if there's a case that involves battered spouse, potentially battered spouse or battered wife syndrome. I'm usually called by the defense first because they raise the issue. If you're called by the prosecution, whether it be federal or state, what oftentimes happens is it's in response to a defense expert that's been called. So do I agree or disagree with that other expert? So I'm usually the, the call usually comes first from the defense. But in terms of who I'm hired by, it's it's pretty even. It's about 50 50. Now, this time you are on the profit of witness of the expert in the field of forensic psychology. Yes, approach. Objection is sustained. Wait. Objection is still sustained. Mr. Beck, you may continue. Has battered spouse syndrome been accepted to your knowledge in the Florida court system? Yes, sir. Objection, legal conclusion. Sustained. Can you describe the classic system or systemology uh, wherein an individual might necessarily uh, suffer and then exhibit symptoms of battered women syndrome? Yes. Uh, so, 
Battered spouse syndrome is uh, a woman, usually a woman's response. Doesn't have to be, but that's a classic historical research into how women respond in situations in which there's intimate partner violence when they've been the victim of violence. Now we know, of course, in other kinds of relationships, men can be a victim of it as well, or as, whether it's a heterosexual or homosexual relationship that both men and women can be victims. But we still know the majority of those individuals that are diagnosed with that condition or given that condition, classified with that condition, are women. Bless you. We do know that it's a, a reaction, um, a strategy that's developed by the person who's being abused to someone who's abusing them in an intimate partner situation. And essentially what they're doing is they're, they've made a determination that <clears throat> they can't effectively escape from the abuse. They can't just leave for some reason. They feel in danger or they've been threatened if they leave that something bad will happen to them. So it's a cognitive or thinking strategy on the part of the person being abused that I have to develop some coping skills or ways of protecting myself and protecting myself or maybe even loved ones as well from some form of imminent violence or danger or lethality. Something bad will happen to me if I don't develop a way of handling this abuse, this constant abuse that's coming towards me. So the battered wife syndrome is really a way of thinking. It's a psychological change that happens with a victim in terms of the way they cope and strategize to stay safe for themselves and other loved ones as well, oftentimes. I'm going to ask a really silly question, if I may, doctor. Um, I don't know if you noticed a bruise across the bridge of my nose this morning. I did see that when I came in. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, this weekend, um, okay. Hypothetic, okay. hypothetically, if an individual was digging around in the garbage, the lid fell down and cut his nose, the bridge of his nose wide open, would you, as a forensic psychologist, anticipate or psychologists in general, anticipate that there might be a physical or a psychological reaction response to that degree of trauma? So I, I don't know if it would be trauma or not. It could be, depending on the degree of the injury and the pain and things like that. But certainly you would view, you'd view that garbage can differently as you approached it. Um, so it, it changes your psychology or the way that you look at that particular situation or that particular object. And so by viewing it differently, you may engage in different behaviors. You may approach it differently. You may have somebody else approach it. You may approach it with both hands up. So it changes your behavior and your thinking about that garbage can. Does that also apply to <clears throat> interpersonal relationships? So it certainly can. Um, no two people always react the same way to every situation. Trauma, one person's trauma is not a trauma to another person. But for people who do develop battered spouse syndrome, um, they do begin to change the way they view the persons who's abusing them and what they have to do in order to maintain either their life or their safety, their physical safety in terms of their behavior and interactions with that person. Now, is there a specific set of mm -hmm. criteria that a psychologist, forensic psychologist would necessarily rely upon in attempting to make uh, a diagnosis or assessment of battered women's syndrome. Yes, sir. And what are those criteria? Well, you'd want to see one if something, some type of abuse has occurred. That abuse can be physical, it can be sexual, um, it can be emotional, or it can just be the threat of abuse or bad things that's going to happen to you. So there has to be something bad that's happened or that's threatened to be happening over a period of time. So abuse has to be present in order for this to be underway. Without abuse, there's no battered wife syndrome. But that's not enough. Um, there also has to be what's called coercive control. Coercive control is really keeping the person's social interactions, you know, overseen on a regular basis, controlling money, controlling uh, preferences, even TV preferences, sometimes social media, looking at social media that the person is accessing or looking at who they're talking to on Facebook, who they're texting, so it's a combination of abuse and coercive control that results in a person feeling victimized, but that's still not enough. Um, that person then has to feel like they can't escape from that. Uh, they've either been told, if you leave me, you're going to die, or a family member is going to be harmed, um, your children, your mother, whatever it might be. And as a result of that, they develop strategies to cope with that, acquiescing, pleasing, doing anything they're asked to do, demeaning themselves, allowing themselves to be controlled. Um, all of the things that would 
fend off, if you will, some abuse or attack or threat to them or someone who surrounds them. So those would be the components that you would need to have. And that dance continues to go on usually repeatedly throughout the course of that relationship. So I think what you're describing is, mm -hmm. in a sense, a subjective nature to uh, the syndrome that's being described. It, it's both objective and subjective. So objective in terms of the facts, like what's really happening. A person's being abused, they're being told certain things, there's control over them. But then a subjective part is the person's interpretation of that, their perception of that. So there's really both going on. And they have to kind of work together in order for this syndrome to be formalized and properly diagnosed. You indicated that there sometimes may be some defense mechanisms that are or strategies that are devised by the battered individual, the abused individual. Yes, sir. Uh, in your experience and your training, uh, do controlled substances, alcohol, um, drugs frequently appear in your analysis or assessment? Uh, yes. And the way they appear is they can appear either from the abuser or the abused or both. Um, what can happen from the abuser standpoint is they may only be abusive or the abuse may become worse if they abuse substances. From the abused standpoint, it may be self-medication, may be a way of coping with the anxiety. There's going to be something bad that potentially could happen to them or somebody else. It's, it's kind of a way of dealing with walking on the eggshells. Um, so if I use substances that can deaden the pain, if you will, for me, or help me to forget about it. So it's oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes part of either the abuser's behavior or the abused behavior. Do they, in your experience, mm -hmm. do they on occasion uh, actually defend the individual that is abusing them? That's a very frequent part um, of this syndrome. Not always, but it's very frequent. It's, it's why interviewing them becomes difficult sometimes. Because they're used to explaining away their behavior, the abuser's behavior, my black eye, my missing tooth, um, his screaming and yelling in the background while I'm talking to mom on the phone. So they're used to making excuses for it's part of the coping strategy, trying to explain away this behavior. He's had a bad day. Um, she's, you know, really upset about something else that's going on. She's really never like this at any other time. So defending that person is or oftentimes a part of the battered spouse syndrome and getting the person who's been abused to get them to stop defending them so they can talk about the actual abuse becomes a challenge. Now, the DSM makes reference on occasion to rule out, uh, assume for the diagnosis that's being applied. What is a rule out? A rule out in our parlance says that we should consider these things before we look at other diagnoses. So, for instance, if we're going to consider schizophrenia, we should rule out substance abuse first, because oftentimes some drugs can create hallucinations and delusions and psychotic symptoms. So there's always rule out, just like there are for medical conditions. So look for this before you consider this is really what a rule out is. Are there specific rule outs for Better women's syndrome for PTSD? Sure. So there's rule outs for everything because you're considering a number of different conditions before you make a differential diagnosis or you pick that's the one that I think best fits this person. So, yes, there's rule outs for both of those. For my sake, what is a differential diagnosis? Uh, that's how you, you decide which ones, whether it's your medical doctor, your psychologist, whoever, it's how they pick the right diagnosis. So you're going through kind of a hard catalog in your head and you're saying, all right, there's symptoms of this, but that's also consistent with symptoms of that. So is it schizophrenia? Is it bipolar disorder? Now I have to ask more questions. It's a decision tree. And that decision tree helps you to inform the person and either make a diagnosis in a legal setting or help to treat them clinically. Now, if the individual, the psychologist who's doing the evaluation, identifies the presence of certain rule outs, uh, what is their response professionally to those rule outs in establishing or assessing the patient? You have to go down a decision tree. Um, and we all kind of do decision trees in our mind every day about what we should do or shouldn't do in certain situations. It happens automatically. It's more structured when you're doing it professionally. So if you have a concern about substances, then you would kind of take that track and you'd have to ask a lot of questions in that area. Um, so you'd want to know what kind of substances, how often are they using those substances? What kind of effect have those substances had on them before? 
I just picked one of many possible rule outs there. But every one of them, you'd have to explore or ask additional questions because, of course, you want to come up with a wrong diagnosis. Because in a legal setting, that leads you to a bad opinion. In a clinical setting, it leads to bad treatment. Now, I want to go back just a second. We talked about the subjective nature of the, uh, the abused individual's uh, understanding of what's happening. Uh, is this subjective or, or does the experience that they have suffered uh, result in, on occasion, their experiencing or, or their anticipating or assuming or imagining a threat that others may not? Yes, sir. Yes. Objection is sustained. Doctor, from what you described this morning, uh, I think we're talking about a complex and sophisticated process uh, for assessing and diagnosing PTSD, uh, battered women, the matters that you described. Is that a fair statement? Yes, sir. And in this instance, uh, this particular matter regarding the state versus Sarah Boone, uh, were you approached about the possibility of doing an assessment as to Sarah Boone? Approach. Objection sustained. to do an evaluation in these matters. What is your practice in regards to the assessment proceedings, the assessment efforts? Well, I'd first want to know what type of an assessment that, that it is, um, because there's different methods of approach that you'd use to analyze and be able to give an opinion on whatever question is being asked of you. So the very first goal for me as a forensic psychologist is to isolate what the question is. Um, so what are they asking me to do? Because I want to know, A, can I do that? Am I qualified to do that? Or should I refer that to somebody else? Or B, is that something I'm going to have enough uh, time to do and enough resources to do? And the next thing I would do is start asking questions about specifically what you already have or what can you get to help me answer this question. So right away, I'd start to find out what's available. As forensic psychologists, we're supposed to do comprehensive evaluations of whatever the legal issue or question is, and it's supposed to rely on multiple sources of information. So depending again upon the question, I'm trying to then define early on what are those multiple pieces of information I'm going to need to help to try to give an opinion and an educated opinion about that matter. Have you done an assessment in this particular case? No, sir. Can you... Tell us very briefly what that was your decision. Objection, Alice. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Let's right, move on. Objection sustained. In your experience, doctor. Thank you very much. Can battered women syndrome uh, rear its ugly head, for instance, mm -hmm. when there are threats to other members of the family, uh, two legged or four? So, yes, sir, it's very common um, that it's not just the person it increases the terror from someone who's doing the abuse to mention other family members that they might also suffer abuse. So whether it's emotional or physical, those type of things are very common, not always, but it's very common in the course of domestic violence cases or intimate partner violence cases. And that fear uh, that's developed by the abused individual. Uh, may exist contemporaneously with other issues, alcoholism, uh, schizophrenia, and 
and the like. Is that correct? Yes, sir. They can all be combined together. Um, and, and certainly that increases if there's other family members that are threatened or live in the same home or close by. That can increase the terror. The purpose of that is to increase control, to make sure the abuser has more control over the person who's being abused. One second, Your Honor. May I? Yes, sir. In doing an assessment, doctor, would, do you look at outside materials? Yes, sir, always. And what kind of outside materials do you necessarily review in order to make this assessment? Uh, specifically to battered woman syndrome? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So specific to this, you, you'd want to look at a lot of different sources of information because you're trying to, A, make a diagnosis if there's a trauma-related disorder, but you're also trying to figure out if there's the other elements necessary to make the diagnosis as well, like abuse that's been chronic over a period of time and that the person feels they can't leave that situation and if other people have threatened. So you'd want to know things like not only what the facts are of the particular incident, usually some crime that's been committed, but you'd want to know the history of those behaviors. Has anyone else seen those? Are there people you can talk to, you know, friends, neighbors, bosses, anybody who's seen or heard of this abuse before? Have there been medical visits where the person has actually been damaged and shown up, made some other excuse, they slipped or fell or whatever it might be? You'd want to do psychological testing as a forensic psychologist because we have very good tests that help us to determine whether someone's suffering from a trauma-based disorder or not. You'd want to know if the person um, who had been accused of the crime for this type of evaluation made any statements to the police. Um, if they did, you'd want to hear that statement. Or has there been a 911 call? Um, it, or calls. If that's happened, you'd want to hear that too. So any evidence you could collect, and these are some of those questions I was talking to you about before, you'd want to ask the person who's trying to hire you in the beginning, well, tell me what you have, because you'd want to see whether or not you're going to be able to make this analysis or not. So it's not good enough just to talk to the person, because that's just one form of information. It's almost like being a behavioral detective, if you will, as a forensic psychologist, because we're trying to get as much evidence wrapping around our interview with the person as possible to be able to guide our questions, but inform us and see whether there's what we call convergent validity. It's a fancy way of saying, does everything agree with each other? Does everything connect in a way that it all sort of makes sense? Or are these strange conflicting pieces of evidence that we need to explain away or it just doesn't fit the criteria? So it's a rather comprehensive and complex evaluation has to be conducted to come up with this. And the final piece I'd say about it is that um, because oftentimes the abused person is defend, defending still the person that they've oftentimes committed a crime against, it, it takes a bit of time to get to where you need to go. With all victims of trauma, whether you're talking about situations where you're doing therapy or you're doing an analysis in this type of setting, a, a criminal setting, it usually takes some time to break through that and get them to trust you to talk about the trauma, but to stop defending the person and talk about the abuse and how they felt about the abuse. Your goal, if you will, is to be able to see what's happening in that situation through the abused person's eyes. If you look at it through your eyes, um, often it doesn't seem to make sense. But if you look at it through their eyes, if it meets the criteria for a battered spouse, then you can better understand their world and what they're dealing with. And real briefly, some of the things that you are evaluating when you uh, examine, particularly the individual themselves, uh, you're looking for anxiety and or fear. Yes. Uh, low self-esteem. Yes. Are you looking for depression? Yes. Uh, are you looking for uh, any form of social or interpersonal withdrawal? Uh, withdrawal, especially if it's forced withdrawal, controlled withdrawal, if there's consequences to socializing with my family, my friends, calling them on the phone, texting them. So especially in that context. Uh, sure, that can be part of it. So it's really adapting to someone who's uh, captive or taking over a person, controlling their life, sort of adapting to that situation. Um, the famous model of that would be Many, many decades ago, a woman called Patty Hearst, who was kidnapped, 
but it's taking on the beliefs and taking on an acceptance, if you will, of a kind of a captive situation. And in these situations with women who have been abused who meet the criteria um, for battered spouse syndrome, they oftentimes adapt, defend, and take on in an acquiescent way that this is okay and I'm part of this situation as opposed to opposed to the situation. Will this syndrome uh, exhibit itself in physical attributes? It, it can um, at times, even physical illness at times. Uh, inability to sleep, inability to keep food down and those type of things. Sure. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, would that individual potentially experience hypervigilance? Uh, well, that's a, a large part of it. Of any trauma-based disorder is hypervigilance. What changes when you've been traumatized, any kind of trauma, not just abuse, but what changes is your perception of danger. So whether it's the lid of the garbage can hitting you on your nose um, or whether it's someone being abusive towards you, those situations change your perception of danger. So you no longer see that object or that person in the same way. You have a, a foreboding sense of danger could occur. So other people may not perceive it with that person. He's so nice at work or he's nice in these other settings or he's so great on the softball field, but at home he's different. So that person who's being abused, their perception changes. Does that include denial? It could include denial. And oftentimes that's part of the explanation. The defensiveness of that person is the denial of how bad things are that are going on. Any cross examination? Yes, sir. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. Nice to see you in person. Good to see you again. So there is a subjective component to trauma, is what I understand you're saying, correct? Always. Yes, sir. And so hypothetically, a couple could be in a three and a half year relationship with physical violence, emotional violence even sexual violence, but either or both of those partners may or may not believe that is a traumatic experience for him or herself, correct? Yes, sir. People mistake the stimulus about what happens as the trauma, but the trauma is really the reaction to it. So bad things that happen, people don't always react in the same way to them. So yes, sir, that's correct. So for instance, a homicide detective or a homicide prosecutor may go out to a scene and say, see a freshly dead body, and their perception of that environmental stimulus may be very different from somebody who works at Dunkin' Donuts and, and just gives us muffins in the morning coming across a dead body. Is that fair? Yes, sir. That homicide detective may be able to go eat lunch right after it. And the other person who works at the, the donut uh, restaurant may not be able to eat for a couple of days as a result. So, yes, perception is a, a big part of how trauma occurs. And I understand your answers today. Um, and I'm not saying that they were different the other day, um, but I understand you to say that it's very important to do a comprehensive evaluation um, to get the full picture of what is going on in uh, the perceived uh, battered spouse's um, mind. Yeah, correct? Can we, can we approach? Yes. The objection is overruled. So. We've been talking about the importance of doing a comprehensive evaluation with as many collateral sources as one could possibly have uh, when making an assessment about the battered spouse syndrome, correct? Yes, sir. A relevant piece of information. Yes, sir. And would you agree that obviously the person who uh, is accused of committing a crime, uh, there are credibility issues that you do need to uh, care for when relying upon that person's history provided about the events leading to that and the past events describing the relationship with the intimate partner. Yes, sir. In every forensic evaluation, that's the case. Is this particularly important if there's a comorbidity with an alcohol abuse disorder? Yes. And can you tell the jury what alco alcohol abuse disorder means in the DSM-5 TR? Sure. It's the biggest part of it is it's not just the use of alcohol, it's impairment that happens as a result. So it's the excessive use of alcohol, but that could mean something different, just like the excessive use of marijuana might mean. But it's the use of alcohol to the degree that it impairs or affects a person's life. And with that may come a lot of other things like deceitfulness or aggression or um, unreliability, um, sleep or somatic problems, difficulties. 
So, but the important thing to remember there is that it's the use of a substance that impairs or affects a person's life. And if there is alcohol involved in the histories being given about either the event in question or any preceding events, um, must the evaluator take that into account when evaluating the memories and perceptions of the person giving them that history? Uh, yes. So in introducing that new topic about memory, we know that substances can interfere and impair memory. So as a result of that, you want to know what they were using, how close it was. If you're talking about a particular event like a crime, you would want to know if there was substance usage. And if so, what the person's memory functioning was and does that match up with other sources of information about what those events were? Are you familiar with the narcissistic personality disorder? Yes, sir. Of course. Is that something recognized in the DSM-5 TR? Yes, sir. And can you tell us whether or not a person who is giving a history, um, whether it's the patient slash client or whatnot, has traits, um, perhaps not a diagnosis, but even just traits of the narcissistic personality disorder? Is that something the evaluator should account for in evaluating the credibility of the history given? Yes. And why is that? Well, because all forms of disorders or conditions or just traits may lead to inaccurate information, either not purposely or purposely. They may be deceptive. So certain personality disorders or traits can lead to deception or inappropriate or inaccurate information. That's why you need more than one source of information. Does what this per is what this person is saying to me check out with other sources of information? And I don't mean to quiz you on it, but can you tell us some of the criteria for the narcissistic personality disorder? I can. Yes, sir. So it is a grandiose sense of self-worth. Um, it's the consideration of yourself over anybody else. Um, it's kind of operating your own world. So it's an inflated sense of who you are. It's a misperception of how important you are to other people, and your meaning to other people. Um, it's a sense of specialness that you stand out from other people in terms of special skill or skills and that other people, if they don't recognize that, they should recognize that. So the heading, the biggest heading there is an inflated sense of self, uh, self-esteem and grandiosity. Are you familiar with an adjustment disorder diagnosis? Yes, sir. And can you, is that in the DSM-5 TR? Yes, sir. Correct. Can you tell us about that? Adjustment disorder is a person's reaction, and it could be emotional, it can be behavioral, or it can be both, to a situation that occurs. Um, you broke up with your boyfriend or girlfriend, so you're upset about that. And so as a result, you're tearful, you're anxious or nervous or worried about what may happen to you as a result of breaking up with them, um, or you behaviorally may not start not going to work um, or get into more arguments or fights um, with your children as a result. So it's a temporary reaction um, to a stressful situation that occurs in some individuals. And hypothetically, if a person who is um, giving a history uh, for criteria of diagnosis, <laughs> that. if somebody is giving uh, a history and that is being used uh, to come to an evaluation uh, conclusion of battered spouse syndrome, if that person has been diagnosed with adjustment disorder predating be a traumatic relationship. Is that something the evaluator should take into account? You'd want to know any prior diagnosis um, because it may not necessarily be exclusionary, but it could. So adjustment disorder is a temporary reaction. You're upset at a temporary period. Most of them just go away on their own. Whereas something else like a traumatic stress disorder is long-term, something that a person's stuck with for a period of time that usually doesn't just go away on its own. So yes, you'd want to know that for that term I used before that differential diagnosis, you, you'd want to know those things to compare and contrast them and hold them up against each other. Now, hypothetically, if somebody says things like, I'm the best thing that has ever happened to you and um, you're the, I'm the best you'll ever do, are those indications of the narcissistic personality disorder? Well, they could be. You wouldn't want just that alone. You'd want to see if that was happening in other settings. Is that happening on the job with friends, with family members? Is it showing up on psychological testing? But certainly that would be a red flag. You'd go, hmm, I want to pay more attention to that. I want to investigate that further. And is it important uh, when evaluating trauma-based disorders, because they're based on emotional reactions, to do that rule out on alcohol or drug use? Uh, certainly you'd want to do that. It's not usually disguised as a trauma-based disorder. Alcohol and trauma don't, aren't usually rule outs for each other, but it could exacerbate a condition could make you diagnose a trauma condition when it's just an adjustment disorder. 
I say just, I don't mean to minimize it, but it's not as serious as a trauma-based disorder. Is it important to consider whether the abuser and or the abused mm -hmm. behave differently uh, in the absence of alcohol or drugs? Yes. Why is that? Well, because you're, you're trying to analyze a psychological condition. If as a result of drug or alcohol abuse, their behavior changes or their perceptions change, that's not a psychological condition, that's a substance abuse disorder. So that's why you'd want to know that. So if their condition remains the same, maybe it's a little worse when they're using drugs or alcohol, but it's the same perception of threat or danger, then you're going to diagnose a trauma-based disorder. If not, then you're going to diagnose a substance abuse disorder. You can have both, but you'd want to rule one out as opposed to the other. And are you familiar with the classic three-step <laughs> cycle of battered spouse uh, syndrome or domestic violence? Yes, sir. Can you explain that to the jury? Sure. So there is a cycle of violence that was first developed by a woman in the 70s called uh, Lenore Walker, Dr. Lenore Walker. She's a psychologist who's usually credited with developing the whole theory of battered spouse syndrome. And in the classic model, which we know oftentimes happens, not every time, but in the classic model, there's a period of, of tension buildup where things are happening, little arguments are happening, there's bickering back and forth, there may be some threats or some loud voices back and forth, but it's all things that are leading up to a possible violent episode. Then there's the episode that happens itself, the violent episode, it could be verbal, sexual, physical, um, but there's the violent incident that occurs. And then after that violent episode occurs, there's a honeymoon phase where the person who's done the abuse they're apologizing, taking that person who was abused out to dinner, buying them things, saying nice things to them, complimenting them to sort of make up for the abuse. And it's kind of a, it's called the cycle of violence. And the reason why is it, it tends to repeat itself in a lot of these situations of battered spouse syndrome, where you see this repeating itself over and over and over again. So people are kind of stuck in these revolving doors in their relationship. And can one cycle be enough to traumatize a person? Yes, does this trauma necessarily have to be coming from a man to a woman? No. And in fact, as times have changed, language has changed. And so when we keep referring to it as battered woman syndrome in the courtroom today, what we're actually talking about now is battered spouse syndrome or even intimate partner violence. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, interpartner violence can happen outside of legal settings, but it's really a kind of the, the large over grouping, if you will, to be able to talk about all of these other things that can happen as a result, like trauma-based disorders and battered spouse syndrome. Um, and you're right. Um, the later research has kind of pulled us away from thinking this only happens to women in heterosexual relationships. We know now there's all sorts of derivations and that men can be suffer also from battered, wife, uh, battered spouse syndrome, battered person syndrome, um, homosexual couples. So we, we know it goes around to everybody, but still, Women are more often diagnosed with battered spouse syndrome than anybody else. Does the trauma have to come in the form of physical violence? No, sir. Does it have to come in the form of sexual violence? No, sir. Can it come in the form of emotional or mental violence? Yes, sir. And would examples of that include such as running the partner down and telling them that they're no good and, you know, just general insulting and lowering their value? It could. Remember, that's the stimulus. So it would depend on how the person who's receiving that responds to it as to whether or not it becomes traumatic. But yes, sir, that'd be the first red flag you'd want to investigate. And you mentioned isolation before. So if somebody in a hypothetical intimate partner setting is trying to isolate <clears throat> the partner from his or her family members or friends or coworkers, can that be, and I'm not saying necessarily, can that be indications of uh, intimate partner violence that could lead to battered stuff? So sure, that'd be an example, of course, of control. So if a person was doing that, that's consistent with that, that, that classification of battered person syndrome. Yes. And hypothetically, controlling another person, your the intimate partner's personal property or effects, such as a birth certificate or identification papers, um, can that be indication of emotional trauma towards the partner who, who is lacking the control over those identification papers? So that's a stimulus that could result, depending on how the person subjectively perceives it, in some trauma. So yes, all of the things that you mentioned could be stimulus, if you will, that a person could perceive as traumatic. And hypothetically, if one partner A gives partner B a gift, such as a bicycle, but partner A continues to maintain that the bicycle is his or hers because he or she bought it, even though it was a gift of B, can that be a form of emotional abuse towards B. 
Sure. It sounds like control, but I, I guess you can interpret it as emotional abuse too, but um, it sounds more like a, a control mechanism that'd be consistent. I'm not suggesting that it's legally or morally okay, but when one intimate partner uh, does these hypothetical emotional things, non-physical violent things to partner B, if partner B has poor personal skills and coping skills and may be consuming alcohol, is it unreasonable or unfathomable to uh, hear that partner B res responded with physical violence to partner yeah, B? Yeah, I assume your facts are not in evidence. Sustained. Yes. After hearing argument of counsel, the objection is overruled. So let me respond to that. If you remember the question, do. please go ahead. Um, so it would increase the probability of physical violence. So if those things, in fact, were perceived as threatening or abusive in any way or insulting to the uh, person who they were directed towards, it would increase the probability of physical violence. And then again, the perceptions are all in the eye of the beholder, whether um, emotional things that are said to one another or physical things are done to one another, whether the recipient of that behavior use it as trauma is a subjective decision by that person. Right? Yes, it's a, the perception is the impact. So that's how you would know that. It's just you know, water off a duck's back, or is it something that kind of stuck with, sticks with me and I think about it all the time? Now, you mentioned earlier um, anxiety, low self-esteem, and depression can all be components of battered spouse syndrome, correct? Right. Is it important as the evaluator to rule out whether or not these conditions predated the violent or abusive relationship? Yes. And why is that? Well, because where things start is important diagnostically. So if all of those things were in place, all of the symptoms that were just mentioned are in place, then you wouldn't attribute those to the abuse. You'd say those things were pre-existing. Now, abuse could make it worse, but in terms of your diagnosis, you need to know where things started. So if, things, if those symptoms didn't start at the time where there was abuse that was alleged to have occurred, then it's unlikely that it's attributed to that abuse. And independent of any narcissistic personality uh, disorder traits, would you agree that anybody in a, in a certain legal setting has a motivation to present themselves in a certain way? Uh, yes, to do impression management, either depending on the outcome. So if there, there's punitive sanctions, they may lie to make themselves look worse. Or as a result, if they're in other settings, like divorce settings, they may lie to make themselves look better. So there's always some impression management you have to kind of look through in your evaluation. That's important for an evaluation. It should be looked at in every evaluation. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any redirect examination? Yes, Just want to one more time in response to the state's questioning, you indicated that where an individual's credibility might be in question, there is a necessity that the individual who's making the assessment to corroborate whatever they're being told. Is that correct? Yes, sir. In a number of different ways. We have psychological tests that assess for things called malingering or faking mental health problems or difficulties. So you'd want to do that. You'd want to look at other evidence to see if it's all consistent. So it's very important you don't just rely on self-report. Right. Mm -hmm. It's possible that uh, an individual may exhibit one or two uh, attributes of a particular uh, DSM diagnosis, but not actually qualified because it's simply not there. Right. Sure. So sometimes like social isolation can become, be because we're introverted um, or it could be part of depression. So you need to kind of follow it out and see how many of the symptoms are there to see whether or not it meets the criteria. Well, I may exhibit one or two symptoms of narcissism, but not qualify because I don't meet all of those. Uh, or a significant, a significant number of the uh, indicators that you would rely upon to make that diagnosis. Yes, sir. Or, or it can be situationally based, like we may display narcissistic features here um, in a courtroom, but may not do that in any other part of our life. Now, in your experience, has have you determined, learned, either through your um, studies, experiences, and so on, whether or not the abusive 
behavior may begin uh, based upon an individual's perception of things occurring to him as a child or her as a child. In other words, if they if they grow up in an abusive household, okay, I understand. Sustained. You've indicated that there are things that I think in response to the state's cross examination uh, that there are things that may add to uh, or may contribute to uh, a particular psychosis or symptom. Uh, would an individual's background as a child include those type of criteria? Yes, sir. You, you're more vulnerable to certain psychological conditions based on your history. So if you've been uh, traumatized before or bad situations have happened to you before, if you've suffered from depression before, it makes you more vulnerable to those conditions or other conditions later on. Finally, one question or one uh, symptom that we haven't discussed, I don't think, or maybe it was discussed by the state, was learned helplessness. What is that? Learned helplessness, I've really spoken about it a little bit, but now we have the, the fancy term for it. Uh, learned, learned helplessness was really researched by someone named Seligson, a doctor named Seligson, a psychologist, research psychologist. And just real briefly, um, what it is, it's when someone kind of gives up and feels like there's nothing that they can do to change their situation. It was originally done with laboratory animals. But um, where a person really feels that no matter what strategy they've taken, like leave, stay, fight, whatever it might be, it won't work. It usually leads to depression or developments of other strategies, like I have to appease or please or make sure I do everything correctly or apologize. So it's really believing that no matter what you do, it won't be effective. Doctor, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for sure. traveling up here from Miami so early in the morning. No Scott, problem at all. Thanks for the rest. Thank you, sir. You can be excused. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> can the parties approach for a moment? <clears throat> Members of the jury, it is 1040 at this time. We're going to go ahead and take that mid-morning break. Um, similar instruction I've given you over the last couple of days. I'm sure you're tired of hearing it, but I got to keep telling you. Please don't have any conversations among yourselves or anyone else about the persons, places, things, or charge involved in this case. And do not conduct any independent research on those things. We'll see you back here in about 15 minutes at 5 till 11. Thank you very much. Y'all may be seated. Thank you. All right, we'll be in recess for approximately 15 minutes. Thank you. We are back on the record. 2020 CF 2603, State of Florida versus Sarah Boone. State. State has strong behalf of state. Defense. James Owens for Sarah Boone. Tony Henderson for Sarah Boone. Kevin Beck on behalf of Ms. Boone is still seated at council's table. Yes, Mr. Owens. Judge, we, we had several language that were scheduled for Sarah Boone. Uh, Mr. Owens, can you please state your name for the record? Based on the testimony of Detective Carlson, we just excused Abraham Moreno, who was going to be recalled based on the testimony of Detective Carlson. Um, you've heard from the two deputies, you've heard from Dr. Brand. Maria Gallup Holy he is a young lady that's outside. Uh, she was a witness as a neighbor in that complex and she would testify about observing physical injuries to Sarah Ben. Um, we, we've spoken with her over the break that in our opinions collectively, Tony Anderson and myself, that uh, it's not necessary 
to call the scout fully if we have other evidence of injuries. There was disagreement about that, but I believe that Ms. Finn is now the leader. That will not call the scout polling. So that leaves now um, calling the uh, Orange County Sheriff's Department um, phone extraction expert. Ms. Uwadden. Yes, back to the stand. And we've got two short videos. These are the short videos relating to George Torres with the bat and then striking the TV. They're less than a minute apiece. Uh, the problem with that is because we've excused so many witnesses, that's our last witness. So we're going to be done here in probably 11.15. And then... Um, but Miss Walker is supposed to be here at 1 o'clock? That's correct. Okay, all right. And then I, I haven't had a chance to meet with Dr. Harper, but I'm going to meet with her at lunch mm -hmm. over next door. And we anticipate Dr. Harper this afternoon. And then we may be really close to ending the defense today. Okay, great. Thank but you for letting me know that. We're going to have a, a gap. Okay, so early lunch. Well, yeah, long lunch. that may, well, if you're saying that your um, presentation with Ms. Wadden is 15 minutes, I'm, I don't know what the cross is going to be. It may be de minimis, or you may be saving her for rebuttal. I don't know, Mr. J or Mr. Cacciatore. As it relates to Ms. Wadden, CSI Tech. You're not calling her in rebuttal. Okay, awesome. So what we can do is we can proceed with Ms. Uwadden and we could just take an early lunch and ask them to be back here maybe 1250. So that way, if we have any issues, we can address them before we start at one o'clock. Um, Ms. Boone, you were sworn this morning. I just got a couple of things to go over with you. Um, there was a list of witnesses that was provided to the court last night and again this morning as potential witnesses that may be called in your defense. One of those witnesses was Maria Gallipoli. Your lawyers have advised that they may not be calling that person as a witness in this case. Did you Do you understand that? I do. And again, similar to other conversations we've had, I don't want to go into any specifics of any conversations that you've had with any of your lawyers, just whether or not you've had them. Have you had conversations with your lawyers about calling Ms. Gallipoli as a witness? Yes. Have you had conversations with your attorneys about why they are deciding not to call her as a witness? And similar to what we discussed yesterday, do you understand that your attorneys make the tri trial strategy decisions, including what witnesses to call or not to call? Yes. Okay. Are you still satisfied with their representation of you in this matter? And are you still on board with the strategy that has been employed in your defense? Are you in agreement with the strategy not to call Ms. Gallipoli as a witness in this case? Aye. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, then let's go ahead and bring our jury back in and we can call Ms. Uwad and go from there. Mr. All right. Can you excuse Ms. Gallipoli? All right. Thank you very much. Let's go ahead and stand and bring back in our panel. Mr. Owens, how do you how do you spell Gallipoli? What I have, G A L I P O L I. Two L G A L I. Oh, two L's.
State, do you recognize our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Defense, do you recognize our jury? Yes. I right, think you all could be seated. Members of the jury, once seated again, if you could confirm that you complied with the court's instructions during our break by raising your hands. Record reflect all hands have been raised. Defense, you may call your next witness. Judge, we would call uh, the phone, forensic phone extraction uh, officer with the uh, Orange County Sheriff's Department, Officer Wadden, right. for the stand. Thank you. We'll bring her in. Good morning, ma'am. Could you state and spell your name for the record for us? First name is Janella, J-U-N-E-L-L-A. Last name Wadden, U-A-D is in Delta, A-N. Counselor, you may inquire. Well, again, your official title? Uh, digital forensics examiner. And are you referred to as detective? Or Just an examiner. Okay. Ma'am, uh, Judge, can I approach the or approach the uh, witness? Yes, of course. Ma'am, I'm, I'm going to show you what's been marked as uh, identification defense exhibit AA. And you recognize that uh, video or that CD of the video? Yes. Well, I think we kind of prepped you on it ahead of time. Uh, that was extracted from uh, the Sarah Boone phone that you were asked to extract? Yes, one of, one of the um, media files, yes. Okay, and is that video a fair and accurate depiction of uh, one of the videos that was extracted from Sarah Boone phone? Yes. And then identification Z, if that's identification, same, same type of question. You've had a chance to review that video, and is that one of the videos that was extracted from Sarah Boone phone? Yes. Judge, at this time, I'd like to have these uh, introduced in evidence. Any objections? No objections. All right, what was pre-marked as AA will be received into evidence without objection as defendant 17. What was pre-marked as Z will be received into evidence without objection as defendant's 18. First. You may proceed. And is there a volume? Judge, do you have control of the volume? Volume is on. You're going to help me take this shit out. Real shit. You're going to help me take it out. You're gonna help me take this shit out. You may proceed.
Spoke Say again, sir. Spoke yes, understood. No right, thank you very much. This witness can't be released, correct? Yes. State. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, can the parties approach momentarily, please? Members of our jury, at this point in time, it's 11.08. I know it's a little bit early, but due to the pacing and uh, how quickly we've been moving through the evidence this morning um, and how the defense has teed up their witnesses for this afternoon, we do not have anyone until 1 o'clock. So at this time, we're going to go ahead and take our lunch break at this time. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a similar instruction that I've given you over the last couple of days. Jurors, you must not conduct any investigation on your own. This includes reading newspapers, watching television, or using a computer, cell phone, the internet, any electronic device, or any other means at all to get information related to this case or the people and places involved in this case. This applies whether you are in the courthouse, at home, or anywhere else. You must not visit places mentioned in the trial or use the internet to look at maps or pictures to see any place discussed during the trial. Jurors do not watch local news or read local newspapers. Jurors must not have discussions of any sort with friends, family members, or even your fellow jurors about the case or the people and places involved. So do not let anyone make comments to you or ask questions about the trial. I want to stress again that just as you must not talk about this case face to face, you must not talk about this case by using an electronic device. You must not use phones, computers, or other electronic devices to communicate. Do not send or accept any messages related to this case or your jury service. Do not discuss this case or ask for advice by any means at all, including posting information on an internet website, chat room, or blog. With that, members of the jury, I'm going to ask you to return here uh, to 12 Alpha at 1250, and we'll pick up shortly thereafter. Thank you so much for your service. Y'all may be fine. Thank you. State, anything we need to address? Nothing. Defense. No, sir. All right, we'll see you all at 1250. Thank you very much. All right, we're back on the record. Case number 2020, CF 2603, State of Florida versus Sarah Boone. Let me get appearances for the state. Steve Castro, on behalf of the state. William Jackson, State. Defense. James Olmos for Sarah Boone. County Henderson, Sarah Boone. Kevin Zach, for the Sarah Boone. Ms. Boone is seated at council's table wearing the same dark gray suit and maroon blouse from this morning. She is in custody. However, there are no restraints as she will be standing as with the rest of us when our jury enters and exits. Um, it's 1257. State, anything we need to address? Yes, sir. Defense. Judge, I've got something. Can we approach the bench? Yes. All right. Thank you all very much. Uh, Mr. Owens, if you could see to calling Dr. Harper at this time uh, to advise her to be here at 1 30 for her testimony. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Just one second, sir. Thank you. Wait for Mr. Evans to return. <laughs> Thank you, sir. 
I only have questions. Without Mr. Owens? Yes, sir. Sure. All right, as we've discussed, um, we're not going to be having the charging conference regarding the jury instructions at this time. That will be conducted tomorrow. Uh, I have been requested the defense to provide any instructions that they are seeking to be provided to the court and to the state in word format tomorrow, including but not limited to 3.6 F or 3.6 G and any portions thereof that the defense is seeking to utilize for the purposes of jury instructions. The courts, the court throughout the trial has been redlining the jury instructions that were provided initially by the state. Uh, at the end of the evidence and testimony presentation this afternoon, the state will, or the court will email those to all parties. Um, once Mr. Owens comes back in from making, um, advising witnesses of when to be here, we will bring in our jury and proceed with the evidence presentation this afternoon. State anything else we need to address? Defense, anything else we need to address? No, you are. Right, very good. As soon as Mr. Owens uh, enters, we'll uh, bring in our jury. <clears throat> uh, the deputies will assist Ms. Walker in the wheelchair into the jury box. Um, no worries. We'll we'll cross that bridge at 1:30 if she's not here, sir. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and stand and bring in our jury. State, do you recognize our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Defense, do you recognize our jury? Yes. All right, everyone can be seated. Thank you. <laughs> Members of the jury, again, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. I see juror number uh, four from the uh, fifth from the right to left, second row. His hand's already out. He knows what's coming. If you can, just raise those hands. Confirm you complied with the court's instructions. All right, record reflect all hands have been raised. All right, members of the jury, um, the defense is going to continue with their evidence and testimony presentation this afternoon. Thank you. Mr. Owens, you may call your next witness, sir.
Ma'am, good afternoon. Can you state and spell your name for the record for us? Did you say? Can you state and spell your name for the record Carol for Walker. us? Walker. B E A R L Walker W A L K E R. Thank you very much, ma'am. Mr. Beck, you may proceed. Good afternoon, Ms. Walker. Ms. Walker, do you know the defendant, Sarah Boone? Yes. How do you know her, ma'am? How do you know Ms. Boone? Can, if you can't hear me, just ask me to repeat myself. And I'll okay. Here, so. Okay. How do you know Ms. Boone? She lives in the same apartment building that I lived in. And can you tell us how long two of you shared the same apartment complex, apartment buildings? About four years. And how is it that you became familiar with Ms. Boone? My husband and I were sitting out on the porch and we see her coming with her two dogs. And what trans, what happened then? Then I will call her over. What, you know, with her dogs. And what do you mean by call her over? When I see her walking with a dog and I see her and I look at her and I said, Hey, Sarah, how you doing? And that's it. And would she generally respond to you? Yes. And how would you spend time with Ms. Boone? Did I spend time? Would you spend time speaking with Ms. Boone? Yes. Uh, how long would you speak with her? About 15 or 20 minutes. That's all. And was your husband sometimes involved in those conversations as well? We just say hi. So you and Ms. Boone were the two primary communicators? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, in the time that you knew Ms. Boone, uh, did you witness anything about her person or her body that gave you cause for concern? Sometimes I would see it like she had been choked around her neck or her arm be hurt, hurt. have a mark on her arm. And I just asked her. And would she describe how that happened? Just okay. say, I had a... Hang on, hang on. The objection is sustained. When you would ask her that, how did she appear to you uh, to respond emotionally to your, your questions about her injuries? She just say, one of them days or something. Jackson sustained. Just for the record, uh, instead of telling us what she would say, would her would she demonstrate any emotion on her face? Well, I would see the emotion that she was upset about. And did you ask about her obvious obvious upset um, persona? Uh, her upset. Uh, the, the fact that she was upset, would you ask her about that? Yeah. Well, okay, you have to, and you have to just limit your, your answer to the question. Would you ask her about that, that issue, or what, why she was upset? Yeah. Okay. And I'm sorry, I just can't go beyond that. Thank you. Now, how frequently would that occur? I would say on the weekends when I see her. Was that primarily when you saw her on the weekends? Mostly I would see her walking through, going to her place. And when she and I'm sitting on the porch and I see her then. Now, let's write that. <clears throat> While you were there, uh, in that apartment complex and excuse me for getting ahead of myself do you still live in that apartment complex no oh 
How long have you been gone for that, from that apartment complex? If you don't know, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Um, <clears throat> during the, the occasions that you had to interact with Ms. Boone, how did she treat you? Nice lady. Overruled. Nice to me. Did she ever act uppity? Overruled. Did she ever treat you in an uppity manner? Which, which you mean? Sir? Did she ever look down on you as a person? Oh no. Did she ever treat you with disrespect? No. Sustained. May I approach on this, Your Honor? Yes. Objection sustained. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm back, Mrs. Walker. In the time that you and Ms. Boone lived together, on occasion, did you see law enforcement arrive at the apartment complex? A couple of times. And did you ever get involved in any of their investigation? No. Were you ever, I'm sorry, were you ever approached by law enforcement and asked for information, evidence, insight into uh, what might be going on? No, sir. Now, in all candor, uh, were there occasions when you believed that Sarah Boone may have been uh, under the influence of alcohol? No, I can't say. Were there? Did you also observe George Torres uh, during the time that you lived together, lived there in the apartment complex? I didn't see him very much. If we sitting on a porch, that's the only time. Yeah. Uh, did you know Mr. Torres very well? No. Was there an incident when you saw Ms. Boone with a black eye? Yes. Did you witness a pattern between Ms. Boone and Mr. Torres wherein you observed signs of abuse? Sustained. You testified that you saw Ms. Boone on occasion with bruises, other injuries, and a black eye. Is that correct? Is that accurate? Yes. Uh, and was there any pattern to what you observed in regards to those injuries and uh, bruises that you observe on Ms. Boone? One time I seen with a black eye and like she had been choked one time. Okay. Did Ms. Boone complain to you about those marks? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Nothing further. Any cross examination? Hi, Ms. Walker. Hello. Is it fair to say you're not sure when exactly you saw any of those injuries on her, correct? Say that again. You're not exactly sure when you saw any of those injuries on her, correct? When she come past the apartment, I'll be sitting out there because we always sit out there. Right, but we don't know if this is. December or 2018 or anything oh, I like that? I can't remember, sir. Okay. And is it fair to say you have no idea how she got those marks? Is that fair? Repeat that again. Do you have any idea how she got those marks? Well, 
on the weekends, I, I, I see him and her go in. But you don't know who, if anybody, put those marks on her, right? Well, I, just have, for yes I can no. tell when they in a, must have had an argument or something. I hear the dogs barking. Okay. And you're five doors down, right? Unit eight, unit three? Yeah. No other questions. Any redirect examining? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Can this witness be released? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, ma'am. <clears throat> Ms. Walker, the deputies are going to come get you and take you out, okay? You all done? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Defense ready to call your next witness. Yes. Yes. First of the jury, um, witness is running a couple minutes late. I think they may be stuck in the security line downstairs. So uh, we're just going to be in a short recess for them to join us this afternoon. Uh, similar instruction that I've given you, please do not conduct any independent investigation or research regarding the person, places, things, or charge involved. Do not have any discussions amongst yourselves or anyone else, and we'll bring you back in as soon as that witness arrives. Thank you again for your patience. Thank 
Y'all can be seated. Thank you. We'll be off the record until uh, Dr. We are back on the record. Case number 2020 CF 2603, State of Florida versus Sarah Boone. State. Judge, uh, before we began trial, uh, I had indicated that in the past, sort of these types of cases, there were problems with cameras showing attorneys' laptops. It brought my attention that that is going on again. I'm, I'm asking the court to order whoever it is who has a camera, whether it be a phone or a court TV pool camera, that they don't do that. Okay. All right. Um, members of the gallery, good afternoon. Um, and uh, the, the TV crews as well. Information that's contained on both parties' laptops, be it the defense or the state, is protected by work product and attorney client privilege. It's not something that's viewable, not something that should be disseminated, and not something that can be looked at unless there is a knowing, knowing intelligent waiver, and that stuff's going to be put out to the public for consumption. So I'm going to ask you as best as possible not to view, take pictures of, or look at any of the laptops, be it the defense's laptops or the state's laptops, to avoid that. With regard to the camera, if we can, when zooming in on either the defense counsel's table or the state's counsel's table, if we can try to avoid their laptops, I would greatly appreciate you, sir. Yeah. And the podium. Thank you. All right, we are back on the record. Case number 2020 CF 2603, State of Florida versus Sarah Boone. State appearances for the record. Dave Kestra on behalf of the state. Defense. James Owens on behalf of Ms. Boone. County Henderson for Ms. Boone. Kevin Beck on behalf of Sarah Boone. All right, Ms. Boone is standing at counsel's table wearing a dark gray suit and maroon blouse. Uh, let's go ahead and bring in our jury as Dr. Harper is here. <laughs> State, you recognize our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Defense, you recognize our jury? All right, thank you. All can be seated. Again, members of the jury, if you could just raise those hands, confirm you complied with the court's instructions. Record reflect all hands have been raised. All right, defense, at this time, you may call your next witness. We call Dr. Julie Harper. Dr. Good afternoon. Could you state and spell your name for the record for us? Dr. Julie Harper, H A R P E R. Thank you. <laughs> Counselor, you may inquire. Thank you, Judge. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I think you've already stated your name, but just introduce yourself to the jury. My name is Dr. Julie Harper, and I'm a licensed psychologist. Would you tell the jury your educational background? I have an undergraduate degree from Oberlin College in biopsychology. I have a master's degree from University of Denver. I went on from my master's degree to earn a psychological doctorate. That's called a PsyD. Uh, that was also from University of Denver. In completing that education, I specialized in psychological assessment, which means I had extra coursework in that area of learning to administer a psychological tests to other people. I completed an APA-approved internship at Washington State University, which means that I was matched, and that was my uh, site to practice being a psychologist for a full year. 
And that was between 1999 and 2000. And following that, um, I turned in my dissertation, which was in the passing of power in couples relationships. I then graduated and started my postdoc work in Pullman, Washington. As part of becoming a psychologist, you have to have uh, over 1,500 to 2,000 hours of supervised work as a psychologist. The person that supervised me was a forensic psychologist. So during that postdoc time, that was my introduction to forensic work while I worked at a community mental health center. Dr. Harper, how long have you been licensed? I was first licensed in Washington State in 2002, so 22 years. What type of position have you held as a psychologist? Well, I was rehired at my internship site, so I worked at Washington State University College Counseling Center. I also worked two times at a community mental health center. The first time was in Pullman, Washington. And that was during the period of time where I was getting my uh, postdoc hours completed. And then I stayed on after licensure. I also uh, worked in Florida. When I came to Florida in 2005, I took a position in the Fort Walton Beach area at Bridgeway Center, which is a community mental health center. And while working there, um, I completed a variety of psychological assessments. I was directing the testing program. I also began working doing the Department of Juvenile Justice contract for, for um, evaluating adolescents that had gotten into legal trouble and needed an assessment for consideration of program placement. I worked in uh, that community mental health setting doing clinical assessments and the DJJ contract and social security evaluations and continued that until about 2010. In 2010, I opened my own private practice, which is Northwest Florida Psychological Services. And in uh, the beginning of the practice, it was a combined clinical and forensic practice, meaning that I spent a majority of time doing psychological assessments uh, to answer questions from physicians about things like ADHD, depression, to make treatment recommendations. I had the therapy patients, and I also did Again, social security disability evaluations, so numerous kinds of assessments. And then over time, I began doing more and more forensic work, including uh, receiving appointments from judges to do competency to stand trial evaluations, sanity at the time of the offense evaluations for Circuit One in Florida. And I continued to do the Department of Juvenile Justice contract briefly, uh, but then that uh, it came up for a bid and I discontinued that contract. What I did is I um, slowly reduced my clinical practice because when you do forensic psychology, it means you have to travel. Your individuals that you're seeing are not usually out in the community. A lot of times you have to see them in jail. So it's hard to maintain a therapy practice and I scaled that back over time. Eventually my practice became entirely forensic. And then in 2017, I took a job uh, with the state of Georgia to be an evaluator full time. I was working doing competency to stand trial and uh, sanity at the time of the offense evaluations, and then assisting with risk assessments in the inpatient setting. I did that until 2021. At that time, my private practice was just um, it quieted down, of course, from COVID, and was I was not in full time practice, so. I wish to return to full-time practice with my own company, and I did that um, in May of 2021. And since then, obviously, the courts are busy again. We're all recovering from the COVID era and back to full-time practice. Now, um, you live. where do you live? I live um, in Okaloosa County, and that is in the panhandle of Florida. And is that where your practice is currently? Yes. Is it fair to say you travel the state to? Bless you. Is it fair to say you travel the state to do uh, assessments or evaluation? That's correct. I travel to a lot of cities throughout Florida, as far south as like Miami, and then of course working along. Is cities. it fair to say that you testify in various counties throughout the state? Yes. I know that yesterday 
you were set to testify in Bay County, Panama City. That's correct. I was testifying yesterday in a death penalty case in Bay County. All right. And when you finished, you drove here? Yes, I did. My understanding is you got here after midnight. Yes. Um, what other counties have you testified? Uh, well, I've testified here in Orange County, um, in Miami-Dade, in Duval. It, it might be hard for me to list everywhere. Alachua, um, Escambia, Santa Rosa County, Walton County, Bay County, uh, Washington. So, so just so the jury understands, the nature of practice is, is you have to travel throughout the state. Well, I do work in cases where the person is at risk of, um, you know, succumbing to the death penalty. And so those cases require repeated evaluations in different vicinities. And so I have been, you know, traveling to work on murder cases. Um, there are psychologists, I suppose, that do forensic work that might just confine their work to one circuit or stay. But I actually uh, broadly travel. You said that your your practice is is now entirely forensic. That's correct. What you said, and you've testified about what kind of forensic work you do. Uh, yes. So, as a forensic psychologist, sometimes I am tasked with testifying about uh, something very specific. So, for instance, a person's ability to uh, stand trial if they're knowledgeable and can go forward with their trial process. I've testified about a person's sanity at the time of the offense, meaning if they had a mental health condition that met the statute as to um, not being sane at the time of the offense. I've testified in sentencing hearings. I've been an expert witness for Department of Children and Families. I've testified in vocational rehabilitation hearings as their expert um, in what's called uh, social investigation, that's what they used to call custody evaluations. So in a numerous capacities. And would it be fair to say that uh, a lot of times you're, you're appointed by the court uh, to provide the service that you provide and you're paid by the state? That's correct. What percentage of your work is where you're paid by the government to do the work? Uh, I would say that the majority of my work comes through with uh, that court appointed funding. I percentage wise, probably about 90 percent. I realize you testify on occasion by the state, but majority of your time, 90 percent, 95 percent of the time you testify uh, on the behalf of the def defense. Yes, the evaluations complete and either a side can call me for testimony and um, majority of the time I'm called by defense. And so you, you make a living by uh, traveling the state and generally the, uh, the court system, I think they call it JAC, pays your, your fees. So I make a living by performing work as a forensic psychologist, evaluating individuals um, most of the time that are incarcerated in a prison or a jail setting, providing consultation to attorneys who might just have questions that would you know, need a psychological expert to explain something to them. I uh, also do fitness for duty evaluations for law enforcement, pre-employment evaluations for law enforcement and firefighters. Um, so depending on the work that's needed, I do those. Doctor, um, how is a forensic psychological evaluation different than a regular psychological evaluation? Can you tell the jury? Sure. So if any of us went into a psychologist's office and had an evaluation done, it would be most likely for treatment. So things like if you qualify for surgery or you can have treatment, uh, maybe you've got a condition that you want therapy for. A psychological assessment is very helpful in identifying a diagnosis and then setting a course for treatment. A forensic psychological evaluation has many of the same procedures, but the aim is really different. The aim would be to answer some kind of legal question that is posed. So as an expert, I might be in the position to provide some education or experiential uh, descriptions of something that a person might be suffering from to people that are going to make a decision. So for instance, if it's a competency evaluation, I would educate 
the fact finder in that case, it would be a judge about what is wrong with the person or if they had any deficits at all, or if they were competent to proceed. In a situation like this, a forensic psychological evaluation might be geared more to identifying, again, if there is a mental health condition um, present in the defendant I'm evaluating, and then to provide a jury with education or, uh, about what I found in my evaluation. How many forensic psychological how many forensic psychological evaluations have you conducted? Estimate. So just as an estimate, it's clearly more than four thousand. I've been doing forensic psychological evaluations um, as far back as two thousand seven. Have you been test Have you been qualified as an expert testifying forensic psychologist psychologist in court as yep. a as a forensic psychologist? I have. And. Um, you said you you've testified for the prosecution. Yes. And you've testified for the defense. Yes. Is there any difference in the work that you do depending on who hires you? Which side? Absolutely not. A forensic psychological evaluation is an objective assessment of what's going on with the person. So you should be performing the same kinds of procedures in doing the evaluation. It should not matter who's retained you, what you're trying to do is answer a question. Are there times when you actually do an evaluation and assess an individual, but then you're not actually called to testify? Yes, many times that's the case. Um, you will provide your um, feedback to the attorney, and then it's up to the attorney to decide if, you know, if there's anything in there that would be uh, useful to them, or if they're pursuing a certain kind of information for the court, they would choose to call you for testimony. Dr. Harper, do you recognize Sarah Boone at the defense table with Tony Henderson? I do. When did you first get involved with Ms. Boone? Um, it would have been in around June of 2020. It was the first I heard of her case. And what were you asked to do? Uh, a comprehensive psychological evaluation of Ms. Boone. And did you do that in Ms. Boone's case? I did. Okay. Were you given materials to review? I was. Is that standard operating procedure? Yes. You assess the client individually one-on-one, -on -one, and then there are collateral evidence or material that you also consider? Yes. Can you tell the jury about that? Yes. So... In forensic work, there are a variety of um, documents that are usually available in assessing a defendant. In this case, for criminal court, you would see things like witness statements. There might be body cam footage or um, just more information about the offense itself. Sometimes there's an interrogation video. Uh, so you would get kind of the legal description of the offense and, and the things that have occurred. I also will often get educational records of a person, mental health records, hospital records, things of that nature that would describe um, their biopsychosocial history to me. And you were given materials as it relates to Sarah B to review? Yes, I have been. How many times did you meet with Sarah Boone? Uh, so... Nine times. All right. Can you tell the jury what you did as part of your evaluation of Sarah Boone? Well, we had a clinical forensic interview in which I reviewed her background history, so her early childhood. I also uh, assessed her with assessments, meaning I um, administered three psychological tests to her. I reviewed her. Uh, prior mental health records, her interrogation video, um, the some prior information about her legal history. So she had been previously arrested. I reviewed that as well. Uh, we had an opportunity to um, review the transcript of her interrogation video. So there were a variety of things that would be considered what I did with her. Okay. So you considered some medical records? Yes. 
And did you also consider some records from uh, George Torres's record? I did see his uh, hospital records. Now, do you consider in doing an assessment and forming any opinions um, an individual like Ms. Boone's upbringing in terms of where they grew up and what their family environment was like? Yes, that's part of gathering their background uh, history. So biopsychosocial information. And do you, did you consider Ms. Boone's upbringing in, in forming any opinion? I did. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So of her history, I found it uh, pertinent that she was raised with... Approach. The objection is sustained. Would you have considered, um, as part of her family background, um, whether or not some of her family members had passed away early in her life? Sustained. You considered the entire family background and history without, without going into the details of what she said or what you learned from looking at records? I'm sorry? Yes. Okay. And did you consider her relationship with her mother as part of her psychological development? Yes. Now, do you believe that Sarah Boone uh, does have some narcissistic traits? I do. Can she does she doesn't qualify or meet the criteria for that diagnosis? Does she? I did not diagnose her with that. Can you elaborate on or explain how you feel that Sarah Boone does have some narcissistic traits? Well, in meeting with her as part of the evaluation, the narcissistic traits that I identified would have to do with, um, as she described, being a straight-A student. She reiterated about her abilities. And I felt that that was evidence that she had low self-esteem and her coping mechanism was to identify what made her stand out. And that would be consistent with the narcissistic trait. Now, I know there's been reference in this case to a manual that all psychologists, all psychiatrists refer to. Uh, do you have that manual with you? I do. And what is the name of that manual? It is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the text uh, revision. So it's the DSM-5 text revision. Now, uh, Dr. Brandon testified earlier today, and there was some evidence relating to when you suffer from narcissism, there's a sense of grandiosity. But is that from this manual in your, your studies and your experience, where they, where they require excess, admir excessive admiration and whatnot, that they, there's a reason for that. If I'm understanding your question, there's a criterion in narcissistic personality disorder related what, to that. What I'm getting to is many times, you may have these narcissistic traits, but really, you suffer from very low self-esteem. That's the underpinning of that criterion. Would you explain that? Um, if I'm allowed to reference the DSM, then I can explain it best. Just don't read from it. Just All right. if, you need to review, if you need to read a paragraph and, and explain it to the jury. So based on the description in the DSM, if a person's self-esteem is very fragile and they have low self-esteem, they may require more outside admiration or even appear more um, grandiose in their abilities because at root, they don't feel secure and confident. And so it's what we would call a defense. And so that criterion is actually a way that a person tries to make themselves feel better. Anything else you want to say about that, that issue? Well, you asked me about why I didn't diagnose narcissistic personality disorder. 
And again, from the DSM, we're to un are there criteria? There are criteria for each disorder. So you, when you're assessing someone, they have to meet all those criteria for you to form that opinion that they actually suffer from that disorder? Well, the first, I guess, issue is do they have the criteria that are listed? And then the second would be, is there a different mental health disorder that would better explain the criterion that you're seeing? Uh, the criterion within the DSM overlap considerably across disorders. And so there are some helpful guidelines within the DSM to remind you of that, that you may have what's called differential diagnosis. So if you're considering one thing, that you also are directed to look at other things. So that happened in this case, in this instance, that the DSM guided me to also look at other things. Just for purposes, to make it clear, you did not diagnose her as with narcissism, that disorder. That's correct, because the DSM's description guided me that that would not be an appropriate uh, diagnosis. Why, why did you not diagnose Ms. Bing with a personality disorder? Well, first of all, it has to be a pervasive pattern of distorted relational abilities. So basically, if she is demonstrating in a variety of settings that she has these symptoms. And then secondarily, the uh, diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder is listed when you're considering personality disorders. The, the DSM guides you that if there are personality changes that are associated with the exposure to a trauma, then you should consider post-traumatic stress disorder and not a personality disorder. Have you diagnosed her with anything? And we'll, we'll elaborate on that, but have, through your assessment, have you diagnosed her with anything? Yes, so she has a diagnosis of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, she has symptoms of anxiety that would be uh, consistent with post-traumatic stress disorder. So that is an anxiety disorder. And you feel like she suffers from post-traumatic stress? I do. Now, at the time of this incident, this event, we're talking February 23rd of 2020, uh, you, would have, you were aware that she, she did not have much family support? Yes. <clears throat> Doctor, why do you administer psychological testing? Psychological testing allows an objective measurement of what the person's symptoms may be as compared to sort of an average. So if we can see what the average range on a standardized measure would be for any person, if there is an interpretable difference, that gives me clinical information. So it's not just relying on what the person has told me. I've got an objective measurement I can compare to other people. And then I also administer psychological testing in a forensic evaluation to help assist me in making sure that the person is um, intending to put in good effort with me. In some forensic settings, a person may have a reason to present symptoms, like if they're in a custody evaluation, for instance, they might have a reason to um, minimize symptoms or they may exaggerate something else. And so assessments as to the person's response to you and if they're validly participating are important. So they're tests to see if you're faking or malingering or that type of thing? Right. And so you would call it feigning mental health symptoms when the person is either far exaggerating a symptom they do have or if they're um, pretending to have a symptom that they do not actually have. Now, as it relates to Sarah Boone, what type of psychological testing did you administer? I administered the um, inventory of legal knowledge, and that is um, a test that has to do with whether or not she was validly participating regarding her understanding of the legal process. I also administered the Miller Forensic Assessment of Symptoms Test. Now, what, explain to the jury what that Miller Forensic Assessment of Symptoms Test is. So that is also a test of feigning to identify if she's validly participating in the evaluation. So if she had endorsed psychological symptoms or uh, psychiatric symptoms, 
that would be unusual or not typical of a valid psychiatric patient. What were the results of Ms. Bing's test on the Miller forensic? Uh, she validly participated. There was no indication of any feigning or malingering. And as far as the inventory of legal knowledge case, what were the results? Again, she was validly participating and she did not even come close to the cutoff that would put her in the range of uh, feigning. Can you tell the jury what the purpose of the clinician administered post traumatic stress disorder scale is? Yes. So that would be considered a very useful assessment of post-traumatic stress disorder. It allows me to interview a person about exposure to a traumatic incident and then identify if there's a change in behavior that has occurred as a result of that exposure to trauma. <clears throat> At the time that you administered that test, did Ms. Boone, in fact, have post-traumatic stress disorder? Well, what, or tell me the results. Yes, the so the results would be consistent with a person having post-traumatic stress disorder. I do not diagnose from one test. That wouldn't be appropriate, but it is consistent with the background and the symptoms that I had previously, um, you know, taken down during my evaluation of her. So the clinical portion, we go through symptoms that was consistent with the outcome of that test. And would this testing, <clears throat> all the testing, help you determine if Ms. Boone had a change in functioning from before the alleged trauma Bless you. To, to after the, the alleged trauma? And I'm referring to the trauma. We're going to talk about what, what the trauma was, but uh, the trauma was the inter, intimate partner violence? That's correct. Okay. But would that testing help to determine if she had a change in functioning from that trauma of the inner, in, intimate partner violence? Absolutely. And did you determine that she did suffer from a trauma as a result of intimate partner violence? That was my conclusion. Yes, that's my opinion. Now, in considering all the available information, you don't just rely on what Ms. Bone tells you. No, no, I don't. I do interview a person as part of the clinical forensic interview, of course, but I also consider things that are um, reported like in the arrest narrative, witness statements, all medical records. So there are a variety of sources of information, collecting data points and reviewing those to arrive at a conclusion. So you did uh, review Ms. Boone's previous diagnoses in her history? Yes. Did you consider the previous diagnoses in arriving at your own? I did, yes. What did Ms. Boone, what had she been diagnosed with prior to you getting involved? Roach. The objection is sustained. But, but you would agree, and I think this is a fair question, you, you would consider prior <clears throat> other experts who, who may have diagnosed her with something. So I would definitely consider her mental health records, diagnoses previous clinicians may have arrived at at the time when I diagnosed her myself. And given given uh, the assessment that you did with uh, Sarah Boone, and considering the totality and the time you spent with her, and the other records, did did you diagnose uh, Sarah Boone with anything? Yes. So post traumatic stress disorder. It's my opinion at the time of the offense she had depression, and she had an alcohol use disorder. All right. I know we've talked about post-traumatic stress disorder. I don't know if I need to ask you anything further. I think the jury probably understands that. Is there anything else you wanted to add about that disorder? Um, I'm not sure what the jury's already been told about post-traumatic stress disorder, but in Sarah Boone's case specifically, because of enduring um, 
So she specifically noted the time that she was stabbed with the knife as being an extremely right. sustained. You you have you have viewed have you viewed some exhibits involved in her being stabbed? Um I think that we have had exhibits in common. I'm not sure what was admitted. Have you seen the physical scar from Sarah Boone being stabbed in the back of the leg? Yes, I've seen her scar. Right. Thank you. Overruled. Just just generally, without getting specific, I, I think I've explained post-traumatic stress, but if there's if there's something else the jury think you believe the jury needs to know, but it's a it's a it's a sort of trauma that occurs as a result of one or more events. Post-traumatic stress disorder is the psychological after effect of being exposed to a very significant stressor or cumulative stressors that make the person's behavior, thinking, and mood uh, change. And so the, the change can include things like the person becomes hypervigilant, is easily startled, has trouble thinking, has trouble sleeping. So their body is in a state of agitation. Can also include include changes in mood that um, would include irritability, uh, difficulty relating to others, and that they might be resistant to trust easily. So those are all features. You have trouble sleeping sometimes. Yes. Sleep deprivation is a is a real issue. Uh, it's associated with things like nightmares and having trouble settling. Now you mentioned that you had diagnosed her with depression. Can you just give us a, a general understanding for the jury of depression? So the persistent sad mood, including feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, having difficulty concentrating, sleep problems, changes in appetite. This would be typical of depression. And Sarah Boone suffered from that? At near the time of the offense, yes. Right. Can you explain to the jury alcohol use disorder? That's that's a fairly new name. That's five or six years ago. We, the manual came up with a different name. It did, right. And so that would be, you know, in layman's terms, you might call that alcoholism. It's a tendency to uh, drink too much and then have some kind of consequence in your life as a result of your substance use. And alcoholism can be, um, de depending on how much you drink and then how often you drink. That's right. All that, all that is something that you would consider in diagnosing? Yes. The many people who suffer from alcohol use disorder, I don't know how to put this, are they in denial? I would say that that is one of the stages of alcohol use disorder and amenability to treatment. So in denial, um, it's because you do not want to acknowledge that there are consequences from your use because in doing that, you might have to reduce how much you're using. So to deny means that you feel that you can continue your use without having to change that. So you want to maintain the access to the substance. You don't have a problem. That's right. What is the difference between traits and a diagnosis? Well, we all have personalities. And so you're going to have coping mechanisms that include personality styles. So for instance, um, even though you might not be diagnosable as something, there are times when if you're upset, hurt, frustrated, you have a mood state that's unpleasant, you're going to deal with that by using some kind of coping mechanism. So traits of personality disorders might be present in the way that you deal with inner pain, things that you don't like. Feeling So some people, for instance, if they feel uncomfortable, they may cling too much or become excessively bonded um, to try to escape a feeling that they don't like. And that might be a dependent personality trait. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have a personality disorder because that would have to be pervasive across like all the environments. But when stressed or upset or not feeling good, you're going to use some kind of coping mechanism and that might be one of the criterion, for instance, of the personality disorder. You would call that a trait. And 
um, is it your understanding that this trauma that one suffers from repeat domestic violence uh, can cause one to be considered suffering from the syndrome, we call it battered spouse or bat battered woman syndrome? Yes. So the diagnosable condition would be PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. That's how a clinician would um, label the response to trauma. The pattern between partners, the person's coping mechanism because of that trauma, that would be what's considered battered spouse or battered partner syndrome. And you're, you're aware that that concept uh, of being traumatized by the battered spouse syndrome or the post-traumatic stress is relevant to uh, a self-defense case. Yes. Yes, I understand that. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, under the battered spouse syndrome, the person would experience a trauma or a situation in which they feared harm. And based on that fear of harm, they would react in a certain way that might not be understandable to other people. So their fear is based on the pattern of behavior between them and their partner. That might not be the case for another set of people. Now, I know that uh, Dr. Lenore Walker is the one who first uncovered this syndrome back in the 70s. Her research study generated the term. Uh, she was interested in why battered women specifically at first, that was what was studied, didn't leave their partner because, of course, they're experiencing traumatic events, risk to their life, but then they didn't leave. So she undertook the original research study on that. Just briefly touch on, because I know Dr. Brandon has this, uh, there was a three stages um, that, that Dr. Walker developed for uh, that syndrome? I think you're referring to phases that a person may go through or the cycle of the relationship. That includes the tension building phase in which there is the first instance that tension is building within the partner. There might be a change in tone, a signaling that there's a, a difference in agitation. The second is the true battering event. So something has happened between the partners uh, and that's violent in nature. And then third, there is the honeymoon phase, which is to keep the relationship intact. Um, the batter would engage in what's like called honeymoon behaviors, like trying to repair the relationship, apologize, essentially keep the victim from departing from the relationship. So those are three phases. And is it fair to say that psychologically, the, the abuser, does alcohol often involved in the abuse? Yes. And as far as the one, the victim, that's getting abused, and you say it's a cycle, is, uh, is the victim, you know, when they go through that last stage, the honeymoon stage, are they thinking, okay, it's, it's going to be better? Yes, the hopefulness in that trying to believe that the behavior has changed, um, that they're not going to be abused again, the hopefulness to maintain the relationship, to forgive, um, that's part of that last stage, phase three, is maintaining the relationship. I don't think I've asked this. Why would someone who has been exposed to intimate partner violence perceive the likelihood of, of a, a, a new violent event about to appear? Why would they perceive the likelihood of that violence differently than, say, a normal person? Well, it speaks to the pattern. So any relationship will have its own special pattern that you have things that only your partner knows about you or certain looks that you give that mean something. And you learn that over time. So over a period of uh, incidents, basically, the victim begins to perceive cues that would signal impending danger. Those cues could be really subtle, just a change in tone or some small behavior that might not mean much to another person, but it has preceded other violent acts. So for instance, if your husband decides that he is not going out that night, he might put on different clothes to stay home. And that could be a signal like a Abuse and violence has occurred in his 
stay at home clothes, for instance, that might not mean much to another person because again, it's specific to that dyad. Those two people know those patterns. So the victim may perceive a small or subtle change in their partner as a cue because they've become hypervigilant. The body knows when it's experienced a threat to itself and it will take note. We record memories differently when we're at risk. So these subtle cues become very well memorized by somebody who's being victimized. Now on this, and, and battered spouse syndrome is a subset of post-traumatic stress disorder, which you've diagnosed Sarah Boone with. Um, when those personality changes occur and they persist after an individual has been exposed to this extreme stress, is that when the diagnosis occurs? Um, the changes would be as a result of the pattern, the person experiences a change like in their sleeping, in their hypervigilance, that's when you can diagnose it. So you can have a trauma or an experience of a you know, scary incident, but it doesn't mean that you will absolutely have post-traumatic stress disorder. You have to have those reactive symptoms that would suggest that it's present. In your opinion, and I know you've gone over this event with Sarah, Sarah Boone, this uh, February 23rd, 2020 event. It, it, is your opinion that she was suffering from battered spouse syndrome at the time of that event? Yes, she had the patterns ingrained in her behavior that would be typical of a victim who's responding to traumatic events in a predictable way. So that would fit that. And it's fair to say that because of the intimate partner and the prior violence, that you would have a heightened sense of when danger or was about to occur. Yes. When a threat was about to occur. Yes. A threat of danger. That's right. Now I want to talk about placating the abuser, a victim placating an abuser. Are there predictive cues which an abuser may exhibit to a victim that result in a high level of anxiety arousal in which the battered woman may attempt to reduce through several different means to delay the beating? Can you explain that? Yes. So the the phase of the relationship that starts with that tension building that is a jumping off point potentially so if you can stop the escalation you might stay in phase one for a period of time phase one being that tension building phase and trying to reduce it and not allow it to escalate so placating the abuser might include distraction it could include um, substance use. It could include a change of scenery. There are a lot of things that a partner will learn to do so that they don't have the escalation into an abusive event, if possible. It doesn't always stop it. Now, in reviewing all of the data, all the reports, medical records, and whatever reports you considered, um, videotape that you may have watched, as it relates specifically to Sarah Boone, are her words her power? Uh, her words, I would say, are the weapon that she has. Explain that. In reviewing the available like videos that I had to review, you would see that when Ms. Boone is very stressed when she's experiencing a high level of anxiety. She becomes short in her tone. You can hear that in her voice. There's a strain, sharper words come out. I think that that is the way that she would try to respond to uh, Mr. Torres. You can hear that sharpness in her voice when she's very stressed out. Now, would you agree that uh, victims may exhibit a range of behaviors when they're suffering from intimate partner violence? Yes. Self-isolation? Yes. Suicidal thoughts? Yes. Substance abuse? Yes. And there are often physical signs of injury, such as bruising, 
That's correct. Chronic fatigue. Yes. Learned helplessness. Yes. Can you tell the, I know Dr. Brandon spoke on it, but could you tell us a little bit about that? So learned helplessness is when you start to form the opinion that nothing's going to make any difference. It comes originally from an animal study um, in which dogs were shocked. And the research study indicated that even when dogs were given an opportunity to escape the environment in which they were being shocked, if they were shocked enough, they just stopped trying to escape. So even though they had an opportunity to do so, they did not do that. That's called learned helplessness. It's the idea or belief that what your actions are going to do are not going to make a difference. So don't try. What are, what are intrusive memories? Intrusive memories are an element of post-traumatic stress disorder in which you don't want to be thinking of a traumatic event, but it intrudes on something else you're trying to do. Like maybe you're folding socks or something like that, just doing something mindless. And that's what takes over your thought process. It's not something that you're trying to think about. We could plan what we're thinking about, or sometimes if you're just having this intrusive experience, that's not what you were intending to think about at all. Is that one of the conditions that someone may suffer uh, when they have the syndrome of battered spouse? Yes. I know there can be triggers um, that that bring on these memories. Am, that, I, am I correct? That's correct. Are there also symptoms of this syndrome where, um, like like in the alcoholism, where you denial that you have denial that you're in the middle of this cycle? Well, as part of the relationship, there's an element of pleasure. Like you you have early on in the relationship, something that binds you together. So you're remembering that you're hoping for that. Um, even though the repeated cycle is going through the phases one, two, and three, you keep hoping for elements of that honeymoon phase, wishing that it was better. So it is like denial. You're um, imagining the way it used to be. You have a recollection of that person showing you positive behaviors and you're you know, hoping for that. I also think it is typical for victims to not reveal to other people that the abuse is going on. And it seems like denial. In other words, your coworkers ask you like, are you okay? Did something happen to you? You're not likely to disclose that. That looks a lot like denial. It is a denial in public of some of the private issues that you're having in your relationship. And that's because it's embarrassing. It's revealing a loss of control to other people. It's revealing that things aren't perfect. You might even get feedback that you should leave your partner and that's unwanted because you're already having that, you know, concern in your own mind about it. And so, you know, it seems like denial on the outside to hide it. Would you agree many people who suffer from this, uh, they're minimizing what is happening to them? Yes. And they're numbing their emotions to it. Well, to stay present and keep that relationship, it's very difficult for a lot of people because they're experiencing physical and emotional harm. So they want to numb it because numbing it means that you can keep that relatedness no matter how bad it's getting. Some people with this syndrome disassociate. Relevance. Approach. Objection to relevance is overruled. Do you agree that battered women often develop the defense mechanism of being able to psychologically detach from their body during a traumatic experience? Some people do experience that. <clears throat> I'm just going to list some of the symptoms that you find in, in battered spouse women and just to see if you agree with these we talked about intrusive memories and flashbacks of the past traumatic events do you agree with that yes severe anxiety and hypervigilance yes the panic attacks that is sometimes present it depends on how the person experiences anxiety but some do have panic attacks very low self-esteem yes poor body image sometimes feeling that they have no control Yes. 
sexual dysfunction? It can be, particularly if the trauma includes sexualized attacks. Short-term memory problems and confusion? Yes, that's part of PTSD sometimes. And they can act, the actual they can actually have physical health problems, chronic from the chronic stress and physical violence. That's correct. Fear. Yes. Constant fear. That is correct. Now, the abusive partner, the abu the abuser. Part of the abuse would be hitting, kicking, punching, choking, burning, and biting. Approach. All right, you may proceed, sir. All right, I'm asking about common things that occur by the abusive partner towards the victim that creates this intimate partner violence or create this syndrome in the woman hitting. Yes, that could be an overt act. Kicking. Yes. Punching. Yes. Choking. Yes. Burning. Yes. You be using weapons to hurt you. Yes. A knife. Correct. Curtain rod. Yes. Threatening to hurt you, your children, or your pets. Yes. Belittling and humiliating you. That's correct. Taking your car keys. That would be considered a form of control so yes controlling your money yes control where you go and who you see correct and who you can talk to that's right force you to have sex when you don't want to yes stalking you yes slapping you correct You agree victims that suffer from this abuse experience feelings of anger? Yes, that can be in some of the phases. Sadness? So, yes. Hopelessness? Yes. Worthlessness? Correct. Intense feelings of fear? Yes. Abusers have a tendency to have low self-esteem themselves. Overall. Abu abuser. Overall. The abuser can have low self-esteem himself. Yes. Have a desire for power and control. Correct. Have a tendency to use alcohol or drugs. Yes. Abusers oftentimes have temper. That's correct. Become jealous easily. Yes. Very possessive. Can be. The victims can suffer from se severe psychological distress. That's correct. Is that what Sarah Boone suffered from? Yes. Yes, sir. Dr. Harper, I'll be showing you Exhibit 14, this is five photographs. Did you watch the video on the TV, the Batman TV? I did. 
you considered that in your analysis and your diagnosis? Yes, I did. I'm going to show you some. Pictures. Exhibit 12. I believe she's testified this is where the curtain on. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Exhibit 11. Are you familiar with this photograph over here? Yes. Exhibit 10, which is her arm. Are you familiar with that photograph? Yes. Exhibit 9, picture of the bloody knee. Exhibit eight, picture of her black eye. Yes, I see. Picture, exhibit seven, picture of her Sarah's lips and eyebrow. Yes. And this, this is a composite exhibit six, which is of the, uh, the staff, staff to the Are you familiar with those? Yes. And I don't know if you've seen this exhibit five, this where she spilled some soup as a result of his thing. Uh, I'm not sure if I've seen this photo, but I've seen the medical record associated with that. We call that burn. Exhibit four. Yes. Same with that. Looks like exhibit three. <coughs> she was slapped. Yes. <coughs> Two. You're bruising in this book. Yes. Did you consider all those photographs informing your opinions that you've expressed here today as it relates to Sarah Boone? Yes, under the substantiation that she has indeed experienced past instances of intimate partner violence against her. Is it fair to say that it takes time, a number of times, to visit with someone like this to build trust? Yes, traumatized people are slow to disclose information. You have to build rapport. You have to make sure that they experience you um, discussing other things without an emotional reaction. They feel easily judged, as we mentioned, have defensive denial, things like that. So you need to build good rapport in doing an assessment with somebody that's experienced trauma. A lot of times they're very slow to open up and tell you about the abuse. That is correct. And they'll actually often lie about it. Deny it, yes. And just say that that's not the issue or they're fine. So oftentimes I'll have an evaluation request come from an attorney who's having difficulty interacting with their client and then it, ultimately, it's a result of trauma. Now, I know that you've viewed everything, and I know you've seen her nine times. Any, did, did you feel like you had enough time? Was nine visits enough time for you to feel like <coughs> you had enough time and information to form the opinions that you've expressed here today and give it to this? Yes. That's all the questions. Okay. Any cross examination? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Dr. Harper. Good afternoon. So you have done some evaluation work on battered spouse syndrome for a prosecution in the past? No. All right. Have you done insanity evaluations for the prosecution in the past? I have been called uh, to testify about that. So you understand when the government obtains a court order for their expert to come in and do an evaluation, it's for one evaluation, correct? Uh, I believe that you're saying that the government can retain their own expert, yes. No, man, what I'm talking about is you just uh, went through that you had nine visits with Ms. Boone. Right? I did, yes. And is, that was over the course of eight different days because two of those visits were morning and afternoon sessions, correct? That's right. And what we are trying to help you uh, have the jury understand is that when you get hired by the government and the court gives you an order to go evaluate somebody, you get one crack at the apple. Is that your understanding from your past work, working for the government? No, that's not always correct. There are many instances in competency evaluations where evaluators will request additional visits if they cannot determine their opinion on the first visit. All right. 
specifically when it comes to an affirmative defense, such as battered spouse evidence and insanity, what is your understanding and your expertise? Um, what is my understanding of the One. issue? Oh. Judge, the question. Legal objection. Objection. Legal grounds. He asked a question about battered spouse and insanity. Objection sustained. When it comes to an affirmative defense such as <clears throat> battered spouse syndrome being used for self-defense or not and insanity, um, it requires a court order for the state to go have an evaluator go, right? Yes. All right. Now, what are the agreed upon criteria uh, for battered spouse syndrome? Well, you would evaluate if the person is indeed suffering from a uh, behavioral response, like a mental disorder. So first of all, has the person demonstrated that they've got a behavioral change? And is it in response to a violent act? Do they perceive threat where they've been exposed in the past? So pattern of violence that has repeated. Does uh, control over uh, another person in an intimate relationship have anything to do with it? Yes, it can. Does isolation have anything to do with it? Yes. And by control, I mean controlling who you go see, who you hang out with, so on and so forth? Yes. And could it involve controlling personal items of the other person as well? Yes, it can. So that's what I'm asking. Like in the DSM-5 TR, I believe you pulled up narcissistic personality disorder. Yes. And so when you do that, it pulls up and it says there's nine criteria and five of those criteria must be met um, to make a diagnosis for narcissistic personality disorder, correct? That's right. Now, battered spouse syndrome is not recognized by the DSM-5-TR, correct? No, it's not a diagnosis. You wouldn't use it as a diagnosis. And what I'm asking is, even though we haven't written it down in V, Diagnostic Statistical Manual, and I mean the like the Ohio State University or something. Is it written down anywhere? Can can one psychologist or psychiatrist rely upon um, a recipe or a list of criteria um, that everyone else would be using in your field as well? There is no standardized approach you must follow. In other words, sometimes. If we have a statute, for instance, it would identify what we must investigate. It, it doesn't exist like that. There's no uh, statute directing it. And there's nothing written down anywhere that says, of these nine criteria, these things must exist. Controlling your partner. Did you review any DCF records in this? No, I didn't receive any DCF records. Did Ms. Boone ever indicate to you at any point in time she became too afraid to let people come over to the house? Yes, there were times where she would um, ask Mr. Boone, so Brian Boone, to not bring him there. And Mr. Boone was aware of this because she would say things like that, correct? Yes. And at different times, she told you that she would go over to Mr. Boone's house to escape the violence of Mr. Torres. That's right. And February 24th of 2020, the child was scheduled to be picked up by Ms. Boone, correct? That's right despite everything that she was aware of and what Mr. Brian Boone was aware of, correct? Right. And you saw in her police interview that she swore on the life of her son that she was telling them the truth, correct? Yes. 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 Object. Approach. Objection sustained. I'll rephrase it. She swore on her son's life that it was not intentional that uh, she ended up killing Mr. Torres, correct? Yeah. I object. Approach. Objection sustained. Question is stricken. Members of the jury, questions are not evidence, and you're not to give them any weight whatsoever. Mr. J, you may proceed. She, quote unquote, swore on her child's life that it was not intentional. That. that. Correct? Before I answer, I'd like you to direct me to that part of her interview. So I'll, I'll strike it with you. Send it. Some of Ms. Boone's um, diagnoses predated her relationship with Mr. Torres, correct? Yes. 
And so when diagnoses predate a intimate, a violent intimate partner relationship, um, there is an independent cause, even though they may then later contribute to phenomena. Well, I wouldn't say that all mental disorders have an independent cause. Okay. Sometimes they're spontaneous or biological in nature. Well, let's talk about her. I mean, you, you're familiar with her prior diagnoses and you went through her childhood, so on and so forth, correct? I did. So she was bringing some things with her prior to Mr. Torres' relationship, correct? She had uh, these. Oh, sorry, yes or no, ma'am? Yes, she did. You reviewed uh, some Advent health records, correct, of <laughs> hers? Yes. And some Aspire records of hers, correct? Yes. And you would agree that there are time in the Advent health records where she goes to the hospital and then leaves before getting treated, correct? Yes. And there are uh, there is a time when she goes to the hospital where she is described, their words, not mine, as having ETOH on board. Yes. Do you understand what ETOH means? In a medical record, you would use that shorthand for alcohol. For ethanol, right? Yes. Drinking alcohol, not the other stuff. Correct. And in the records that you uh, reviewed from Aspire, um, she came with complaints of depression in January of 2018, correct? That's right. And ethanol or alcohol is a central nervous system depressant, correct? Yes. And you're, I know you're a psychologist, not a psychiatrist. So let me know if I'm, I'm pushing you too far and you're not going to answer. Um, but you are familiar generally with the effects ethanol has on the body. Generally, yes. And you can and do make diagnoses of alcohol abuse disorder. I do. And in your professional life or personal life, are you familiar with the standard serving size of, of drinks when you're evaluating somebody's drinking? For instance, hey, I only drink two drinks a day. All right, well, are they 64 ounce mugs of beer or are they 12 ounce? So are you familiar in that context? It might be a question I would ask during evaluation. What are you referring to? Is it a mixed drink? Is it a shot? Like, I try to identify that. Have you ever asked if somebody says they drink two glasses of wine, well, how big are the glasses of wine? Sometimes. And is your understanding that five ounces is the standard serving of wine since it's about 12% alcohol? I'm not sure what the standard size is, but I would ask regarding like a wine glass. And in January of 2018, when she came in crying and complaining of symptoms consistent with depression, she had a blood alcohol level of 0.165, correct? I believe so. And in, in October of 2018, um, when she ended up going to Aspire, when she was found stumbling by police, she had a blood alcohol, breath alcohol of 0.185. I'm reacting to your description of her stumbling by police. I know she approached police for help. So. So there have been two sets of records, but I believe you may have the same set that I received on September 27, 24. Can you turn to page 21 of 57 of the Aspire records? Mine aren't numbered, but I <laughs> will. May I approach the witness? Yes. Thank you. 
Sorry, may I first look? You may. What I'm showing you is what is page 2157 on records from Aspire that was provided to me by the defense on September 27th, 2024. And just at the top, you can read the first of the fourth lines. All right. All right, Judge. I, I would ask that she be allowed to read that entire paragraph under the rule of completeness. Approach. You may proceed, Mr. J. Thank you. All right. October of 2018, or of 2018 there was a second um, visit to Aspire, and that was based upon her being found stumbling by law enforcement with a 0.185, correct? Uh, she walked right up. That. Okay. Um, so I'd have to say no the way you phrased the question. Ma'am, Boone was stumbling due to her level of impairment, paren.185. Yes, I would agree. Is that part of the records you relied upon? Yes. Thank you. When you talked to Ms. Boone about that, um, she kind of just described an event of June of 2018 and blurring those two events, did she not? No, she she told me she had two different Baker acts. Did she describe it as being June of 2018? Um, I'll have to reference my interview note to find that if you would like me to. No. Do you remember giving a deposition on October 1st at the state attorney's office downstairs? I do. And um, at that point in time, and I'll ask opposing party, you want me to uh, show her prior statement? Before I, ask her. I think she's got a deposition. Do you have your transcript? I do. Okay. <coughs> Just so for the record, it's page 34 that I'm referring to, line 16 to 17. Yes, I'm with you. Okay. She described that as June of 2018. That's when I said in my deposition that she was ex uh, describing her experience in June of 18. And she described this experience as uh, going to the hospital to find a pastor, correct? Yes. And ends up going to what we call Lakeside then and Aspire now, right? Yes. And then what you described was she was talking about more of the violence that occurred specifically um, regarding a significant episode of Jorge driving her roughly in the car, so on and so forth, correct? Yes. All right. Those were two separate incidences. January, when she came looking for the pastor, correct? Um, so I'm just clarifying that there's a record that we started with this conversation from October of 2018, and there is a description of her trying to go to the hospital to seek a counselor. So those are two different instances. In, in January of 2018, when she went to the hospital crying and, and signs of depression, Bless you. she indicated that was because her husband and son had uh, gone out of town and she was feeling lonely and sad about had, having lost her job a few weeks earlier, right? There were numerous stressors there, yes. Nothing mentioned about any problems with somebody named Mr. Jorge or George Torres, correct? You're talking about January? Yes, ma'am.
so the hospital records are not referencing her relationship with George on the January date. Now, in talking about February 23rd, 2020 with Ms. Boone, you talked to her about that on several occasions, correct? I did. And part of one of those conversations, at least, was about an incident that she indicated had happened the night before February 23rd, 2020, correct? Yes. And she indicated and told you that she had been dragged down the stairs the night before um, the suitcase incident, correct? That's right. And in part of your review of this case, you reviewed all the crime scene photos, correct? Yes. And those include photographs of Miss Boone, correct? Yes. And um, were there any indications in the photographs of injuries on her consistent with being dragged down the stairs of the carpet? I, uh, not, I didn't see inside her scalp. So I didn't see photos of inside, you know, her hair follicles and this area of her head. On her outward body, there were no indications of that. Did you ask her uh, how it was that she was injured during this dragging down the stairs? Um, I don't think I went through specific injuries to her, no. Do you agree that alcohol intoxication affects the credibility of a historian that's providing history to you, patient or a client? If they're actively intoxicated, yes. <clears throat> we had talked, well, we, you and Mr. Owens, um, had talked about narcissistic personality <clears throat> disorder earlier. Yes. And that is a recognized diagnosis in the DSM 5 TR. That's right. And there's nine of those, correct? Nine traits. Are you talking about you're talking about the criterion of narcissistic personality yes. disorder? Yes. So like the page 761 on your hard copy. Thank you. All right. Am I close? I have a digital copy. 760, but <laughs> One of the criteria is have a grandiose, grandiose, grandiose sense of self-importance, for example, exaggerates achievements and talents, expects to be recognized as superior without commensurate achievements, correct? Yes. Two is preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love, correct? Yes. Three, belief that he or she is special and unique and can only be understood by or should associate with other special or high status people, friend, or institution, correct? Uh, so three, just caveat, it says believes, not belief, but uh, the rest of what you said I agree with is the criteria. Four, requires excessive admiration. Yes. Five, has a sense of entitlement, friend, unreasonable expectations of especially favorable treatment or automatic compliance with his or her expectations, correct? Yes. Six is interpersonally exploitive, friend, takes advantage of others to achieve his or her own ends, correct? Is interpersonally exploitative. Seven, lacks empathy, is unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings and needs of others, correct? Yes. Eight is often envious of others or believes that others are envious of him or her. Correct? Yes. Nine shows arrogant or haughty behaviors or attitudes. Yes. Now, you believe that she has traits of that disorder, correct? Right? Yes. Grandiose self. Sense of self-importance? There are indications that she feels like that or has expressed that before. So that's a yes. Yes. Preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love? No. You remember going to the state attorney's office on October 1st, 
2024 and giving a deposition. I do. You know, it's in front of a court reporter, like not in court reporter here. Yes. And you swore to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, correct? <coughs> and referring to page 89, <laughs> lines 18 through 20. Let me know when you're ready. Are you ready? Yes. Did you give the following answer to the following question? Preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love? And your answer was yes? I did answer yes there. She does not, according uh, in your estimation, does not believe that she is special and unique and can only associate with high status people, correct? No. Does not require ad uh, excessive admiration, correct? Correct. Does have a sense of entitlement? Yes. Is not interpersonally exploitive? Correct. Is not. And when discussing whether or not she lacked empathy or was unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings or needs of others, you indicated that that might be the case, but it's not intentional. In other words, she's not aware if she's inconveniencing others. So there was three of those traits, correct? Yes. Not five, which would be required, correct? For a diagnosis of the personality disorder. If that were the correct diagnosis, you would need five. All right. During your conversations with Ms. Boone, the defendant in this case, uh, she explained to you that cheating to her means when Mr. Torres would look at pornography, correct? Correct. Not a real life woman, right? No, not that he was engaging in sexual intercourse with actual women. Part of the records that you did not uh, review were the text messages that were part of the phone extraction of her phone device, correct? That's right. You indicated in your conversation with uh, Mr. Owens that some of the traits that are common, commonly seen in abusers would be control, jealousy, easily angered. This could be, yes. What other traits for just common for abusers? Um, being a person who segregates their victim away from other sources of support, somebody that exhibits coercive control, meaning that um, they would prevent the person from engaging in activities that would be independent, so restricting their ability to have independent like life, job, money, things like that, that would be um, supportive of them being left, for instance. Uh, other things would be using emotional expressions like rage to cause a physiological reaction in another person. So those could be additional descriptions. Specifically, the materials you reviewed. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Paperwork from prior cases uh, involving Mr. Torres and Ms. Boone. Yes. Medical records for Mr. Torres. That's right. The medical and Aspire records for Ms. Boone that we've discussed. Yes. The crime scene photos from the incident in February. That's right. Pages 1 through 413 in discovery in this case. Right. Um, a photograph of a suitcase and two videos involving the suitcase. That's right. And additional videos uh, on that phone, correct? Yes. Uh, such as uh, baseball bat smash on the TV? That's part of it, yes. And then did you review any um, other videos where there's conversations between Ms. Ms. Boone and Mr. Torres? Yes. One prior 911 call? Yes. Now, today, you had indicated um, that you had reviewed the photographs from some prior incidents of violence, um, correct? Yes. When is it that you did that? Is that recently? Um, no, there are, there are um, photos included uh, with the, um, the 
prior case packages? Case packages. Thank you. I'm not sure what to call it. So that's fine. All right. All right. And did you review any body worn camera from those prior case packages? No, I did not. I didn't have that. Anything else that you reviewed that I've not covered? Are you speaking of documents only? Yes, yes, materials other than uh, your nine visits with Mr. All right. Just checking with That's the funders I prepared for today. Um, I don't know if, I guess it would be part of the discovery, the investigative report is within those. 413 pages. Did you interview anybody else personally besides Ms. Boone? Yes. Who else did you personally interview? Melissa Sexton. All right. Anybody else? No. You didn't interview Brian Boone, correct? I did not. You did not interview their child in common, correct? No. And you didn't review the phone text messages extracted from her device, correct? No, I didn't. Did you review any uh, records from the jail? No. And um, yes. The objection is sustained in part and overruled in part. You testified earlier um, in the normal course of practice of forensic psychology and psychiatry, you all do rely upon the diagnoses of other experts, correct? You can inform my opinion, yes. And you have not re reviewed any electronic communications um, in the form of text um, regarding Ms. Boone's case, correct? No, I did not. Or re recorded phone calls of any type, correct? Uh, well, 911. Other than that? <laughs> no, other than that. Now, let's talk about the February 23rd, 2020. Um, she told you that they didn't really have anything going on to do that particular day, correct? Yes. It was a Sunday, correct? Yes. Um, did some chores, and then as a reward, uh, they could rest after doing those chores, correct? Right. She indicated to you that she and Mr. Torres did not begin drinking till about 4 p.m., correct? I'll have to reference. Page 36 of your deposition, if you care okay. to use that. 36? Yes, ma'am. All right, I'm with you around 4 p.m. Um, and you reviewed the crime scene photos of this case, correct? I did. That included receipts uh, for some purchases that were made at the Publix on February 22nd and 23rd, correct? That's right. And one of those receipts was a purchase for a, a 1.5 liter bottle of Woodbridge Chardonnay at 12.17 p.m. on February 23rd, correct? Yes. Did you question her about the inconsistency of them having purchased uh, a bottle of wine at 12.17 that afternoon and not start drinking until 4 p.m.? No. And did she tell you that they had any wine left over from the day before that they consumed that day? At some point, I'm not sure if it was the day that I was going through this line by line with you in my deposition, but I am aware, yes, that there was an uh, unfinished bottle of wine from some other date. And then, as the receipt showed, there was two additional bottles of 1.5 liters of wine purchased at 12.17 p.m. and about 5.30 p.m. on the 23rd, correct? Right? right. And... Were you aware of approximately how much Ms. Boone, the defendant, weighed at the time of this offense, February 23rd, 2020? Uh, around 100 pounds. And in the first 413 pages of discovery, I believe, was the autopsy report, correct? Right. And so you're aware that Mr. Torres was 103 pounds at his death? Yes. 
Do you take into account uh, this alcohol consumption when evaluating what Ms. Boone is telling you about the events of the day? Yes. Did she tell you whether or not she was intoxicated by the amount of alcohol she consumed that day? Please Hi. silence your cell phone. Okay. You may proceed. So she did not describe herself as intoxicated originally when we discussed this. So, um, so the answer is no. She did not describe herself as intoxicated. intoxicated. Right. Hypothetically, hypothetically, if she had told the jury that she was intoxicated at the time of the offense, would that affect um, your evaluation of her credibility of the history she provided you? No, because that was also my opinion. <clears throat> did she indicate to you um, in describing the events of February 23rd, 2020, that there was any point in time she just simply did not remember? Yes. And what points in time were those? Um, so she did not remember taking the videos of the suitcase or you know, the incident in the suitcase until she was at the interrogation room yes, and then they were going through them with her and she recalled that i'm talking about specifically with you did she indicate that there were any portions of the night that or day or night that she did not remember Uh, I can't recall anything specifically right now. Hypothetically, if she had indicated to the jury mm -hmm. that she did not remember the nine or 10 minutes immediately preceding the first video being taken, would that be inconsistent with what she told you then? No. Well, she didn't indicate to you that she forgot any part of the night, right? Right. She just didn't say that. So. Would it affect your evaluation of what she told you about the events of February 23rd, 2020, if she hypothetically has testified that she did not remember 10 minutes or Not really, no, because it, the event and the, like the course of events that she narrated to me occurred over several hours. So when you interview somebody about circumstances of an offense, it's the usual for someone to not remember every single minute for hours at a time. I can't imagine that anybody's memory could hold that much unless they have like photographic memory or something. I'm not asking about hours and hours of, you know, itemization of her day's events. We're talking about the 20 minutes of the offense. Um, does that affect your the way that you give her history she provided you? Just yes or no? No. Now, what she indicated to you was the day had been going well. It was fun and games, correct? Yes. Conflict free? Um, to her, she said it was a good day. So okay. that's what she told me. She said it was a good day. Yes. And... There comes a point in time where the activities turn toward hide and seek, correct? Yes. And she goes up to the shower. Right. And when she comes down from the shower, that's when Mr. Torres is in this suitcase, correct? Getting into it. And she goes over to the suitcase and zips it, correct? Yes. And did she describe whether it was 100% zipped to you or just a certain percentage? Uh, she said that it wasn't zipped all the way. And still then, that was funny to the two of them at first, correct? That's right. And then there came a point in time where Mr. Torres was getting mad about being zipped in the suitcase. She told me that he was getting mad. Yes. And that, in turn, made her mad. That's right. What the, Mr. Torres was saying was, I can't breathe, correct? That is what's recorded on the video. Well, I'm asking you about what you recorded her saying. Well, what made her mad was not that he was saying he couldn't breathe. It's what he was saying that was making her mad. What else was he saying? 
Um, she, at the time, she said that he said something that was making her mad. And so that's the extent of what we talked about at that moment. So you didn't elaborate what something was that made her mad, right? Right. She said he said something that made her mad and that started making her mad. You didn't uh, find it important to learn what specifically he said that made her mad, correct? I don't agree that I didn't find it important. Okay, and explain, why wouldn't you ask that question? Because as a person who is traumatized is describing their experience as a trained clinician, you will allow open-ended discussion of that experience. And so it's not an interrogation. You don't go asking confrontational questions at the time of their first narration. Well, you had nine visits with her. Did you follow up on your ninth visit? I asked her different questions about did you ever ask her confrontational. Did you ever ask her specifically in any of your nine visits with her what it was that he said that made her mad? No. She never described him doing anything to make her mad, but it was words, correct? Right. And once she got mad, she decided that she was going to leave him in there for two minutes. That's right. Not three, not one, but two, correct? That's what she said. And the reason she was doing that was because she wanted him to understand how it feels to be choked and what she had experienced. That's right. Did you ask her why she didn't let him out of the suitcase after two minutes? Um, yes, I did actually ask her that. Well, she thought that he could get out himself. That's one thing. She said that when she was able to unzip it, it was not um, some significant thing. She was able to unzip it easily. So she said it never occurred to her that he couldn't get out. You may proceed. And you reviewed the still photograph um, of the suitcase as well as the two videos. Right. And did you understand what the metadata or what the timestamps were for each of those items? Um, I'm sure when I reviewed it, I saw the timestamp. Yeah. Would you agree that 20 minutes is 10 times as long as two minutes? I would. And if Mr. Torres had not been able to get himself out of the suitcase within 20 minutes, um, she didn't, she didn't indicate that she let him out, correct? She did not. She described to you, Ms. Boone being the she, that she was helpful to the police? Yes. Do you consider, do you agree with that assessment that she was helpful to the police? Um, in the sense that, uh, she was having conversations with them without counsel, I would consider that helpful to the police. Do you think lying to the police is helpful to the police's investigation? No. Do you agree that she was not truthful with them? Uh, yes, I think that I would agree with that. And when she described getting Mr. Torres out of the suitcase, she described stretching his little legs? Yes. And she stated to you there was no fight that day, correct? That's right. She just wanted him to be uncomfortable. I need to clarify. Physical fight. Though. Right. Yes. Um, just wanted him to be uncomfortable. Yes. Correct. And then there was a description of a bat and her using it to nudge, right? Poke. Poke. And so do we agree that that means like, poking out like this as opposed to swinging it like your baseball hitter. I would agree with you. And you reviewed the autopsy uh, report, correct? I believe so. Did you get an opportunity to review the autopsy photos? Yes. Did you question her when she said that she only poked him with the bat? 
No. Not in any of your nine visits? Um, did I question her about whether, can you just repeat the question? I want to make sure I'm answering it correctly. Yes, okay. Um, did you ever, um, in considering the autopsy report and the autopsy photographs that you reviewed, yes. when she said that she nudged or poked with the baseball bat, did you ever question her about that, um, given the severity of his injuries? So to answer correctly, I did question her about say? how she used the bat. Okay. She reiterated that she poked and she gestured what she meant. So I did question her about that. And did you have any questions about that history she relayed to you, given the other evidence in this case that you were? Um, just in contrast to the interrogation video. So that you don't it didn't contrast to the autopsy photographs or report. I object. Roach. You may proceed. Did she indicate all this nudging and, or poking with the bat was done while he was inside the suitcase? Yes. She never told you that there was any nudging or poking with the bat when he was outside the suitcase? Right. She indicated that um, she ended up flipping the suitcase over face down? That's right. <laughs> Did she tell you about um, Mr. Torres calling his brother earlier that evening? No. Did she ever give you a, a history about a, a loud boom occurring inside of her townhouse that evening? No. And you never had the opportunity, obviously, to interview Mr. Torres about these things, correct? Of course not. No, no other questions. Any redirect examination? Briefly, Yes, sir. The state attorney talked to you about um, power and control that an abusive partner will use power and control over the victim in a uh, intimate partner violence situation? Yes. Threatening someone's dogs, is that uh, an example of someone using control? Yes. Taking car keys from the other party, is that an example of control? If they're withholding, yes. Taking a phone and withholding a phone? Yes. A debit card? Yes. Destroying a home, TVs, putting holes in the wall. Yes. Not helping pay the rent and other bills. So I would say that that could be withholding that could go under coercive control of another person. What about violating a court order to have no contact with the person? Yes. That's all the question. Thank you. Can this witness be released? As far as the state is concerned, thank you. Mr. Owens? Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Just allow me a moment to talk about Collect all your stuff, ma'am. No worries. Sorry. No apologies necessary. Yes. 
All right, members of the jury, it is 4.01. At this point in time, we're gonna go ahead and take that afternoon break. Um, I got a couple things I got to address with counsel as well, so maybe a little bit longer, but we'll bring you back in as promptly as possible. Again, same instruction I've given you before. Please don't conduct any independent investigation or research as the person, places, things, or charge involved in this case, and do not have any conversations amongst yourselves or anyone else about that. We'll bring you back in as promptly as possible. Thank you. All right. Y'all can be seated. Let's go ahead and take uh, a recess, um, a comfort break for any of us, and then we can address any uh, argument with regard to the uh, any other evidence that the defense may be seeking. Uh, let's come back here in about 10 minutes, so uh, 413, okay? All right, thank you, we'll be in a short recess. All right, we're back on the record, case number 2020, CF 2603, State of Florida versus Sarah Boone. Appearances for the state. Dave Ketchstar, on behalf of the state, William Jay. Defense. James Owens, the defense. Tony Henderson for Sarah Boone. All right, Ms. Boone is seated at council's table wearing the same dark, gray suit and maroon blouse from this morning. Mr. Owens, are there any other matters we need to uh, address before uh, you rest in the presence of our jury? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Good. Judge, there's uh, two orders that I'm going to be requesting the court to take uh, judicial notice of uh, under 90.202 sub 6 and the orders of no contact. I have copies of the certified uh, copies of the orders. May I approach? Yes. State, have you seen them? Sure. Doesn't change my position. I understand, but you have seen them. I have not. You have not seen them. Okay. Doesn't change. Understood. Okay. You can bring them on up. Thank you, sir. Court has been provided no contact orders issued in case number 2019 MM 5062 on or about June 16, 2019, and a no contact order in case number 2019 MM. 5114 issued on or about June 19, 2019. Both cases styled State of Florida versus Torres George Jr. Um, let me hear any arguments as to the judicial notice from you, Mr. Henderson. Judge, I think they're relevant. Uh, I think just from the testimony of uh, Regent Director Dr. Harper uh, saying that an element of control, and control is talked about greatly. By the state, when I point out things hypothetically that they refer to, they refer to them as hypothetically. Um, however, they refer to things that they're developing on this. Um, boom. Uh, these show that they were, in fact, orders, and the orders were for no contact. So these are elements of control in relation to George Torres. Okay. Response. So in regards to the judicial notice aspect, um, we don't dispute that that can be a substitute for authenticity. Um, however, they're not relevant, they're not admissible, they contain statements that were made by people who are not testifying. Um, just because an expert relies on something doesn't mean that it's admissible. What happened during redirect with Mr. Owens was he was asking, what are the hypothetical things that we uh, rely upon um, in making these determinations as an expert about whether there's battered spouse syndrome or not. So one of the many inadmissible things that he uh, mentioned was um, pretrial uh, orders of no contact. So it's fine. The expert can certainly rely on the fact that there may have been pretrial contact orders or no contact orders that were uh, involved in this case and she considered that. That doesn't make them admissible. Um, 
there has been testimony, I believe, from Ms. Moon that there was pre drop no contact order and violations of them. There, it's not a fact and dispute. It's just a, that doesn't mean that the paperwork comes in as evidence. Um, so that's our objection is it's rather irrelevant and hearsay just because an expert relies on inadmissible evidence doesn't make it admissible. What's your response to hearsay? Judge, I, I think under the, uh, as to hearsay, I think the statute takes care of that itself because it says that the court can take judicial notice. So that's that's the foundationary part. And, and it's not hearsay, it's an order of the court. It, we're in a case uh, where we've gotten in evidence of past domestic abuse. There was evidence of it started with the state about control. And these are things of control. And I'm sure the, the state's going to in rebuttal, they're gonna come up with things that they feel either by body cam or any other evidence that shows her exercising control. This shows Mr. Torres exercising control. It is very relevant. But how's it not hearsay? Just because it's a court record, it's still out of court statement. Certainly being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, no contact order. Judge, that's why we have the that's why we have the thing that the court could take judicial notice of. There are certain things that court but, but the case law says you can't utilize judicial notice to get around hearsay. I know 9202 says that I may take judicial notice. 9203 says that upon sufficient notice being provided, which the state is conceding based on their argument, the court shall take judicial notice of items identified in 9202. But my question is the case law, as identified in Professor Earhart's treatise, specifically says in Dufour v. State, 69 Southern 3rd, 235, um, which specifically talks about notice of judicial documents at a court file that, that doesn't get you around hearsay. So what's your response? I'm going to go through here say so you You're fine. Take your time. Yes. I'll start this way first. Um, one of the exceptions to the hearsay rule is business records exception. So if it's a business record and it's kept in a normal course of business, uh, then someone can come in and lay the foundational things for the business record exceptions to the hearsay rule. However, in this case, that would not be needed if the court takes judicial notice of it that eliminates the necessity to do uh, a business record in that foundation because the court, under the statute 90.2026, can take judicial notice of court orders. This is a court order that's certified. I think it's an exception to the hearsay rule. Also, I think the probative value of this, these documents. Uh, outweighs any prejudicial effect. Any other argument? <laughs> no, you wrote. Any other argument, State? The, the fact that there was a pretrial court order of, of no contact between them is going to come in. I mean, on one of the body worn cameras, Mr. Torres is like, well, the court said I couldn't, but she said I could come. Um, so and I believe she testified to that during her examination. My objection is to the paper. Um, the grounds that I've argued. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um,
State v. Mobley, 98 Southern 3rd, 124 by the Florida 5th District Court of Appeal, signed in 2012, says that there's a procedure that specifically needs to be followed for judicial notice is set forth in 9202 and 9203. State is conceding that although there's not a writing, they're not objecting to the judicial notice concept. They're objecting to the uh, evidentiary bases. I do find that it is relevant, but the problem is I have with hearsay. And the court, in relying on the Florida Supreme Court decision in Dufour, D-U-F-O-U-R v. State, 69 Southern 3rd, 235, at pinpoint 253 by the Florida Supreme Court in 2011, which states, while the court may take judicial notice of documents in a court file which were properly placed there, this notice would not make the contents of the documents admissible if they were subject to challenge, such as when a document is protected by privilege or constitutes hearsay. It is an out-of-court statement that is being offered for the truth. To wit, it is a no-contact order. Um, and the requisite requirements for a business record under 98036 subsection A have not been met nor has there been a certificate from the custodian of records as to those things as required by paragraphs, uh, section six, paragraph C, uh, and the timeliness of a certification. So uh, I, I cannot accept judicial notice of these two documents, even though the state is not conceding the procedure for judicial notice, I am sustaining the state's objection as to hearsay under the grounds and the exceptions that you have offered. <laughs> Judge, we do have the clerk of court subpoenaed. Um, I don't know where they are. I assume they're somewhere in this building. Um, I believe they. Sent some message to us back before the hurricane about what they did were to come and we said to be continued. So we haven't gotten back up with them yet. So. Uh, it would take me some time to check on that. It's 430. Was the subpoena still for this time period? Yes, I believe it was a three week period. OK, but we haven't followed back up with them. This, this came up. Sure. Late. I'll give you an opportunity to do that. I don't know whether you could just go ahead and send them to uh, home for the, for the evening and let me see if we could find the clerk maybe in the morning and then we could rest in the morning and if the state has Dr. Warner. Um, it's probably going to take me a little bit. Yeah, time. Well, I'll give you that opportunity. Absolutely. Right if you want to, sure. If you want to try to do it now or do it tomorrow, I'll, I'll leave it to you. Because I can't imagine it would take long if we're able to get a records custodian or a person uh, to lay the foundation. I can't imagine it would take that long. Aren't they in the building? Yes. Third floor. Good job. Sure. I, I suggest we go ahead and let the jury go. It's 4.30. Okay. I don't know how long it's going to take them to do that, but we could, we could present that in the morning and then rest in the morning. And then they All right. That works for me. Um, I'm not going to make some more employee come in to do that. I, I was conceding the authenticity. I just don't, I don't understand the relevance uh, of it coming in. Are you now withdrawing your hearsay objection? Well, it, I still believe it's hearsay, but... I, th I think it's cured by it's a public it's a public record and it's stamped and all that stuff. I know, but no one's made that argument yet. I don't want to punish some poor clerk. Okay. Um, I, I won't object to them coming in, um, but it, it, it's a slippery slope uh, for other records. We'll see what we can do. Okay. All right. So the state is still maintaining its hearsay objection. I do find that it is relevant. Um, so then, what do you, what do you want to do, Mr. J? I'm stipulating to if the hang-up for the court and the defendant is that they believe a clerk in the court needs to come in and testify. I'm conceding that issue, so that person does not have to do whatever, whatever that issue. Okay. All right. Fine. Then, based on the court uh, on the concession by the defense. Um, do you, uh, or I'm sorry, by the state, excuse me. Do you have any other objections with regard to these two non-contact orders, Mr. J? No more. Okay. Uh, for the reasons previously articulated, um, I do find it's relevant. The state has withdrawn its hearsay objection. Do you want these as a composite or individual? Individually. Okay. Madam Clerk, can you pre-mark them and then we'll identify them, please? 
No contact order in 2019 MM5062, dated June 16, 2019, has been pre-marked as AB. And the no contact order in 19 MM5114, dated June 19, 2019, is dated as AC. Mr. Owens, you can approach. Um, let's just tackle a couple other housekeeping matters that we have. Um, we can You can move those in. Um, when our jury returns into evidence, are there any other witnesses, evidence, or testimony, sir, that you're going to be offering this afternoon? I don't believe so, but we, we, we're intending on resting either this afternoon or first thing in the morning, but we want uh, some time to talk to Sarah Boone and explain to her, you know, why we think we should rest, not call any further witnesses, not introduce any other tips, just to make sure that we're almost all on the same page with her about what our strategy is. We'll need a little bit of time. I don't know if you want to go ahead and excuse the jury for the night and then have us come back in the morning and do that colloquy with the court with the defendant. But we do need some time with her. Okay. All right. So then here's what we'll do. I'll bring in the jury and I'll excuse them. You can save those pieces of paper and you can move them into evidence tomorrow morning and then present. That'll work. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um We'll bring the jury back at 9 a.m. tomorrow, and you can continue with your evidence presentation at that time, including but not limited to calling any additional witnesses. Um, court can have any further colloquy with the defense at that time. The state then can put on its rebuttal case. State, how long do you anticipate ballparking it for the court, your rebuttal case? I don't believe Dr. Warner will take long on our part. I'm not sure how long it'll take on their part. And then there's about... Mm -hmm. How, how long is that? I'm not going to hold you to it, Mr. J. Probably less than 30. How long do you anticipate your cross being in ballpark? And again, I won't hold you to it. This Just direct is 30. My cross is probably going to be 30. Okay, what else do you have to present? And then there will be about two hours of videos from body worn camera and from the phone extraction. Mm -hmm. And then uh, reading uh, good bit. Phone check messages uh, with the record. Separate and apart from the two hour video yes. presentation. Okay, got it. All right. Okay, so that's going to take us in tomorrow afternoon. Are we going to be in a position for the state to rest its rebuttal case tomorrow and proceed with closings? Or are we going to proceed with closings Friday morning after had the opportunity to have a full, uh, not that we would not have a full charging conference, but after having a charging conference Thursday afternoon with regard to the jury instructions. I just don't know how long. They, I think all the instructions are pretty relatively simple and straightforward, except for 3-6. Agreed. 3-6-F. I agree. That's not going to be simple or straightforward in any way. I, the instruction is complicated. I agree. And the special jury instruction will back south. Okay. Maybe some... You know, there's different court structures here in Florida that have used the special instructions. There are different, there are different courts in other states that have used a different instruction. We've looked at a bunch of them, so I don't know what this court is going to be inclined to do if if court would be so inclined to give a special instruction on by a spouse and whether or not uh, you want to consider one of the local courts, uh, the, the Palm Beach County case uh, that I mentioned before with Dr. Brennan. There was a special instruction in that case. We've got some from other states. I don't know what states' position is going to be on that. Has a, a draft of that been circulated yet? Not before. Okay. 
All right. All right. So here's here's what we're going to do. OK, <clears throat> let's just see how long the rebuttal case takes. And then if we have to do closings Friday morning, we'll have to do closings Friday morning. I'd rather go through than, and spend the time to make sure that we're all on the same page with regard to the instructions, especially due to the complicated nature of, of 3.6 F. Um, with regard to those, the court will have Ms. Barrios email you tell she just started her drive back to Kissimmee. So it might come a little bit later this evening. I will have Ms. Barrios email to you all the red line that the court has worked on so far of the jury instructions provided by the state. The defense is to provide its markup of the 3.6 F and 3.6 G instructions and any other defensive instructions that the defense seeks to have read to the jury. Before nine o'clock in the morning? I, I think so. That gives the state the opportunity during the lunch hour to review them in advance of our charging conference. Uh, I have it. Okay. Judge? Yes, sir. Uh, there was one thing. The state had filed a motion requesting a special instruction. As to, um, I think it goes to voluntariness. So I read the motion and the proposed instruction. I have no objection. Okay. All right. So, just so the record's clear, we're referring to the state's request for special jury instruction <clears throat> regarding Florida criminal standard jury instruction 3.9b, defendant's statements um, filed October 22, 2024. The Provision that the state seeks to add to the 3.9B instruction reads as follows. Law enforcement is not legally required to ask a suspect whether he or she wants to talk to law enforcement after Miranda warnings are read to a suspect. This is, however, one of the factors you may consider whether the defendant's statements were voluntarily made. The state uh, defense yeah, state. Have I read that correctly? I believe so. Right. And defense, you have no objection. No objection, judge. And it's my understanding <clears throat> that's going to. There's already the standard instruction. That's an add-on to this. It's just a matter of where y'all want it. So I will add this to the red line to be set out this afternoon. Ms. Boone, I want to have a couple other conversations with you, ma'am. Again, I don't want to know specifics of anything that you or your attorneys have discussed. Just whether or not you've had those discussions. Did you hear the court read the proposed additional language to the jury instruction about your statements? Just now? Yes, ma'am. I can. So just to give you some background, ma'am, there's a form instruction. It's 3.9B. And it talks about um, how the jury is to consider your statements that were read to them uh, and provided in evidence through the course of the trial. Uh, and that they're to consider the voluntarily, voluntariness of those statements and whether they were coerced. The state is seeking to add the following language to that instruction. Law enforcement is not legally required to ask a suspect whether he or she wants to talk to law enforcement after Miranda warnings are read to a suspect. This is, however, one of the factors you may consider whether the defendant's statements were voluntarily made. Do you understand that portion of the instruction? Yeah. Do you have any questions about it? No. Okay. Have you had conversations with your attorneys about the proposed additional language that I just read to you? Not yet. Okay. okay. Let's go ahead and have those conversations tonight when you all break, and we can go over this tomorrow when we have the charging conference. But I'll go ahead and add it to the red line for the purposes of our discussion tomorrow. Okay. okay. Anything else, State, we need to address? Thank you. Defense, anything else? No, sir. Okay, let's go ahead and bring our panel back in, and we'll tell them we'll commence tomorrow with additional evidence and testimony at 9 a.m. <laughs>
All rise, Jerry Zenner. State, do you recognize our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Defense, do you recognize our jury? I do. Thank you. Y'all can be seated. Members of the jury, good late afternoon, early evening, I think. Again, could you just raise those hands, confirm that you complied with the court's instructions. All right, record reflect all hands have been raised. Uh, members of the jury, it's 443. We're going to go ahead and break for the evening. I'm going to ask you to be back here at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. We'll continue with uh, evidence and testimony presentation by the defense. Uh, and then we'll proceed accordingly thereafter. I want to read you the same instruction that I've read you multiple times over the last week. Uh, and I beg your forgiveness as you hear it again, but I just have to keep reminding you. Jurors, you must not conduct any investigation on your own. This includes reading newspapers, watching television, or using a computer, cell phone, the internet, any electronic device, or any other means at all to get information related to this case or the people and places involved in this case. This applies whether you are in the courthouse, at home, or anywhere else. You must not visit places mentioned in the trial or use the internet to look at maps or pictures to see any place discussed during the trial. Jurors do not watch local news or read local newspapers. Jurors must not have discussions of any sort with friends, family members, or even your fellow jurors about the case or the people and places involved. So do not let anyone make comments to you or ask questions about the trial. I want to stress again that just as you must not talk about this case face to face, you must not talk about this case by using an electronic device. You must not use phones, computers, or other electronic devices to communicate. Do not send or accept any messages related to this case or your jury service. Do not discuss this case or ask for advice by any means at all including posting information on an internet website, chat room, or blog. With that, members of the jury, again, I thank you for your time, your sacrifice, and your attentiveness in this matter, and we'll see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Anything else we need to discuss, state, before we go into recess for the evening? Defense, anything else? No, sir. All right, we'll see you all tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Thank you very much. Court's off the record.